Okay, well, before we begin, uh, I'd like to say good morning to everybody and apologies for the slight delay, a couple of technical hitches at this end. Uh, before we begin, I would like to uh, briefly set up the basis on which this meeting would operate. Uh, the new meetings regulations allow formal government readings and meetings to be held on a virtual basis without elected members being physically present together in the same place. In practical terms, this means that the Combined Authority Board and Executive Committees will hold virtual meetings on the dates agreed previously by the Board at our annual meeting in May 2019. The virtual meetings will be held using Zoom meeting software. Uh, all notices and documents relating to virtual meetings will be published and circulated electronically. Uh, the conduct of virtual meetings will reflect as closely as possible to the arrangements for physical meetings uh, set out in the Combined Authority's constitution. Voting will be dealt with by the chair, by a chair asking each voting member individually how they wish to vote rather than by a show of hands. The press and public will be able to observe the meetings in real time by using a link on the meeting's webpage. Decision statements and minutes will be published in the normal way. These are temporary arrangements pending the relaxation of social distancing requirements. If we experience any technical difficulties, I will adjourn the meeting briefly while officers try to resolve these. If a board member loses connection, I will also call a short adjournment while we try to reconnect them. If this is not possible, the meeting, as long as the meeting remains quiet, we will continue. If we become in court, the meeting will be closed and rescheduled. We will be taking questions from overview and scrutiny committee in the usual way, and I will invite the vice chair of the committee, uh, Councillor Kevin Price, uh, to join the meeting to put those questions when we reach the relevant items on the agenda. So can I therefore ask all uh, members to keep your microphones muted unless you wish to speak and this will minimize background noise uh, and please keep your video turned on throughout the meeting to demonstrate your presence and allow everyone to follow who is speaking. We'll also be considering an urgent report on uh, uh, on emergency active travel, advance payments to highways authorities. Uh, this key decision is being taken under the special urgency arraignment set out in the constitution and with the agreement of Councillor Dupre, the Chair of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. As Chair of the Board, I have agreed to take this as an urgent item at today's meeting, as required by Section 100B, brackets 4, brackets B, of the Local Government Act 1972. So uh, with that, we will go on to uh, item 1, uh, item 1.1, which is apologies for absence and declarations of interest. Uh, and I will begin by... Uh, calling the names of all of the Combined Authority Board members in order to establish their presence for the record. Uh, board members with voting rights are uh, Austin Adams, uh, Chair of the Business Board. Present. Uh, Anna Bailey, Councillor Anna Bailey, uh, Leader of East Kentshire District Council. Present. Uh, Councillor Chris Bowden, Leader of Fenland District Council. Present. Uh, Councillor Steve Count, Leader of Cambridgeshire County Council. Present. Uh, Councillor Ryan Fuller, uh, Leader of Huntingtonshire District Council. Present. Uh, Councillor Lewis Herbert, Leader of Cambridge City Council. Present. Uh, Councillor John Holditch, Leader of Peterborough City Council and the Statutory Deputy Mayor. Present. Uh, Councillor Bridget Smith, Leader of South Cambridgeshire District Council. Present. And our non-voting co-opted board members are Jess Borden, uh, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Clinical Commissioning Group. I had heard that Jess might not be joining us and uh, probably understanding why, given her role. Uh, Councillor Ray Bisbee, Acting Police and Crime Commissioner. So no Ray. Uh, Councillor David Ober, Vice Chair of the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Fire Authority. Present. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed and welcome all. Uh, so we move on to uh, item 1.2, uh, which is the, the, the Combined Authority Board meeting of the 29th of April, and these are the minutes. Uh, we have received a, a question from the Overview and Scrutiny Committee about a written answer which was provided last month. So I'd like to call um, uh, um, uh, Councillor Price, uh, who I can see resplendent uh, in his uh, post-lockdown beard, uh, and Councillor Price, I'd like you to, to uh, unmute and, and ask your question, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good, good morning. Yes, I, th I think I had a bit of a head start on most people with the beard um, for lockdown. However, it, let's, let's move to the question from the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Um, 
we received a written response following our question to the board meeting of the combined authority on the 29th of April stating that productive discussions were ongoing relating to the appointment of a chair of the proposed independent independent commission on climate change what have these discussions consisted of and have they resulted in the appointment of a chair of that independent commission and other commissioners and what progress on this important piece of work has been made in the last month well i'm delighted that you've asked the question and i'm also equally delighted to uh, to announce that the chief executive in consult consultation with myself has appointed the right honorable baroness brown of cambridge to lead the independent commission on climate change for Cambridgeshire and peterborough baroness brown is a cambridge resident an engineer with experience of senior leadership roles in industry and academia and a preeminent voice for climate change adaption and mitigation of the low carbon economy Baroness Brown currently serves as the Chair of the Carbon Trust, the Vice Chair of the Committee on Climate Change and Chair of the Adaptation, uh, sort of Adapt Adaption Subcommittee, Non-Executive Director of the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult and Member of the WEF Global Agenda, Council on Decarbonising Energy. She was Non-Executive Director of the Green Investment Bank and she led the King Review on Decarbonising Transport in 2008. She is the UK's Low Carbon Business Ambassador. Baroness Brown will be making a statement on her plans for the Commission today and there will be further announcements on the Commission's membership and work program imminently. And I've personally asked her to look specifically, and obviously she has her own remit, she is an independent chair, uh, but I've asked her specifically to look at the mitigation of the impact uh, of our growth agenda uh, and water shortages in the south of Cambridgeshire and how they can be addressed by, uh, by redirecting water from the fens possibly away from the North Sea to, to, uh, to create opportunities uh, for, for, uh, for the south of Cambridgeshire. So those are the two areas that I've specifically last asked her to look at. Uh, I, hope, I hope, Councillor Price, that answers your question. Uh, you're muted, Councillor Price, unfortunately. Sorry, that's, uh, yes, forgetting that. Um, yes, it answers it in, in, in part. The other part of the question was about other commissioners. So you've told us about the appointment of the chair. Um, could you tell us anything about where we are with the other, other commissioners? Yeah, as, as I said, at the last, uh, well, just before I, I mentioned the, uh, the, the, the questions that I'd put uh, specifically to, to uh, Baroness Brown, uh, as I said, there will be further announcements on the Commission's membership and work programme imminently. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, we are being asked to approve the minutes of the Command Authority Board on the 28th, 29th of April 2020. Yeah. Uh, if uh, any member wishes to raise a question of the accuracy of the minutes, please can you raise your hand? Um, well, I had a, a question about the minutes in terms of statements in them about the um, outline business case on Cam Metro um, and also um, the reference to the consultation that took place, which finished on the 3rd of April, two months ago on the Cam Metro. And I, I was just really keen, um, Mayor, to um, ask you uh, for an update about the shape of the report on the outline business case and whether that was still coming uh, to July, because the reference in the minutes talks about uh, summer, autumn, um, and I, that sort of threw me a bit. Um, uh, in asking the question, I'd also welcome and support your announcements in relation to the Climate Change Commission, particularly because it's the right geography to address these issues. Um, we can't do this as individual districts, but I, I'm just keen to get an update, Mayor, on the timing of the outline business case and whether or not that will include and when it, the uh, consultation on the CAM Metro that's now finished two months ago is going to be published. Well, as you're aware, Councillor Herbert, the, the consultation was not carried out at the end of the work on Cam Metro, but during it. Uh, and clearly that consultation work will be published when, when, when that work is completed. Uh, we are also going to have to consider, and I think it's only appetite to do so, uh, the effect of COVID-19 on future transport. And I think that we have to uh, take some time over the course of the next uh, three to four weeks to consider whether we bring forward the report in July or we, or we take stock of the current situation and consider uh, bringing forward the report slightly later in the year. 
uh, I think, uh, to rush through on a transport scheme at this moment in time, given the impact of COVID-19, I think may be not the right thing to do. Uh, and uh, I will take consideration of that decision over the course of the next few weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments on the minutes, please? Okay, so uh, uh, I, will, I will ask uh, the board to indicate whether they are content to approve the minutes. I will ask all, each board member in turn, in alphabetical order, Austin Adams. Approved, James, sorry. Uh, Councillor Anna Bailey. Approved. Councillor Chris Bowden. Agreed. Councillor Steve Count. Agreed. Uh, Councillor Ryan Fuller. Agreed. Councillor Lewis Herbert. Agreed. Councillor John Holditch. Agreed. Uh, and Councillor Bridget Smith. Agreed. Uh, and that's unanimously approved, so thank you very much. Uh, and I will sign a paper copy of the minutes when business run returns to a more normal footing. Uh, item 1.3, we have not received any uh, petitions, so we'll move on to item 1.4. And there have been no public questions or petitions at this time. But as I had said earlier, there are questions from Overview and Scrutiny Committee, and we will take these when we get to the relevant reports. And we move on to the forward plan. Uh, the forward plan is published on the web and updated regularly. The version included in the meeting papers includes the board meeting date of 24th of June 2020. But this remains provisional for now. If there, are, if there are any decisions in the forward plan which are allocated to the executive committees, but which members think they should think should be dealt with by the combined authority board instead, the board will need to take a view. Are there any committee decisions which members would want to be reserved for the board? So we're being asked to afford, uh, approve the forward plan. I'm moving the recommendation from, recommendation from the chair. Uh, my question, chair, mayor. Sorry, uh, um, apologies. Could you please, I should have said this at the beginning, but could you please use, use the hand up function on the, uh, uh, because I can't always see all of you because then you change positions. So if you could use the hand up fu function, I'd be more than grateful. Uh, but I think Councillor Herbert was first to, to shout out and then Councillor Smith. Well, I, I, had a, I had a question about the coverage of the forward plan because normally, um, and I think it's requirement for uh, public authorities to map forward the meetings for three months. And all we have is June here. So um, at what point will the combined authority meet its obligation to, of transparency and give us also the July meeting? Um, I'm surprised that uh, there was actually more information in the forward plan at our last meeting than there is today. Okay, uh, could I bring in uh, Kim Sawyer, please, who perhaps would be able to answer that from an opposite point of view? Uh, thank you, um, Mayor. I think it's actually Robert um, sorry, who's yeah. responsible for the, for the forward plan. Mm -hmm. so. sorry. Apologies. Um, sorry, Mr. Mayor, yeah, the obligation is 28 days. The, the reason, um, and we, we certainly acknowledge this, that it's not as complete as it, as it will be, is, is that we wanted to um, have uh, a confirmation of the, uh, the calendar of, of the meetings before providing this, but I, I can confirm that the next run of the forward plan will certainly be um, comprehensive. Okay, I hope, I hope Councillor Herbert, that, that answers your question. Uh, Councillor Smith, you also indicated to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So just clarification about the June meeting. So when the board last met informally, um, we did talk about the possibility of having an additional extraordinary meeting. Um, but it, I think, I don't think we, I know that we haven't made a decision about that. And when next we, we are due to meet informally, I gather we are making a decision about whether we actually need that extraordinary meeting. And yet we have a second meeting uh, in the forward plan, which is not highlighted as an extraordinary meeting. So it looks as if it's just a regular ordinary meeting. Um, so this rather conflicts with my understanding of last time we met informally to discuss this. I just wonder why that extra meeting's in the plan. Uh, Mr. Parkin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so an extraordinary meeting uh, can be called at much shorter notice um, than actually we are looking at for the 24th of June. And given that we're at the AGM and we can set the meetings 
plan ahead, it was felt that to promote transparency, there was an opportunity to put a placeholder in, uh, and that is the 24th. So whilst it is, it, it is anticipated that, where that, is that meet, if that meeting is to proceed, it's on a, it's on a special item uh, and a single item. Um, almost certainly, um, we took the view that actually in terms of promoting transparency, we had an opportunity to, to put it out there that it was going to happen. Um, there are separate provisions in the Constitution um, technically for calling extraordinary meetings, but they are, uh, they are at much, short no, much shorter notice. May I come back, please? Of course you may. Thank you. So I think at the very least it should have been highlighted that that, that was a placeholder for a potential extraordinary meeting because actually I think it's misleading rather than transparent. And since the, um, the members you know, were quite clear that they were, they were reserving any judgment about this until we met later, actually I don't think it should be there, but you know, the very least is that it should be appropriately uh, signposted. Um, I don't think there's much more that Mr. Parkin can say. I mean, it's it's just a, it's just a, a space on the calendar should it be needed. I don't think it's anything more uh, dramatic than that. And uh, it's up to the members of this board uh, if it's needed. It's needed. If it's not, it will not be utilised. Um, so I will now ask each voting member of the board to indicate whether they're content to approve the forward plan. Uh, I will be moving this from the chair. Do I have a seconder, please? If you could indicate uh, by raising. Uh, the raised hand button. I'll second Mr Mayor. Thank you. I've got, I've got Chris Bowden who has indicated by his hand so uh, Councillor Bowden has, has, has seconded so uh, I'll ask each voting member of the board to indicate whether they're content to approve. Uh, Austin Adams. Approved. Uh, Councillor Bailey. Approved. Uh, Councillor Bowden. Approved. Councillor Count. Agreed. Uh, Councillor Herbert. Agreed. Councillor Fuller. Agreed. Councillor Holditch. Agreed. Councillor Smith. Agreed. Okay, on that basis, the forward plan is, is approved unanimously. Uh, and so we move on to item 1.6 of the Command Authority Board meeting. So the report recommendations to note the members and substitute members appointed by constituent councils to the combined authority for the municipal, municipal year of 2021 uh, and, uh, and uh, appoint the business board's nominations member and substitute members and confirm the following bodies giving uh, co-opted member status etc. Um, Robert Parkin would you please introduce the report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This, this, is a, this is a standard item of business for the AGM uh, and as the uh, recommendations uh, neatly summarise, it is seeking um, the, the, the confirmed formal appointments to the combined authority uh, by constituent councils, as well as the business board nominations uh, and co-opted status, um, the, um, and as well as uh, substitute representatives. We've also included uh, in LIM E uh, a, a provision to allow myself once the, uh, the last of the AGMs is run, that's Fenland District Council, then I can um, confirm appointment with immediate effect. Uh, the, uh, the papers on the website that members hopefully will have before them, Appendix 1 sets out the membership in detail. Thank you, chat. Thank you very much, uh, members. No comments, so I will move the recommendations from the chair. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Bowden is first up. Um, the recommendation is uh, C to confirm co to member status of the Police and Crime Commission and represents the Fire Authority and uh, Clinical Commissioning Group uh, for 2021. And recommendation E to agree the late notification of appointments to the monitoring officer shall take immediate effect. We require a two-thirds majority vote in favour. If the vote is not unanimous, I will ask the monitoring officer to confirm whether these recommendations have been approved. I propose to make take the recommendations together unless any board member objects. If you do so, please raise your hand. Uh, I will now ask each voting member of the board whether they support the recommendations for item 1.6. So we begin, as always, with uh, Mr Adams, Austin Adams. Uh, Councillor Bailey. Agreed. Councillor Bowden. Agreed. Councillor Count. Agreed. Uh, Councillor Fuller. Agreed. Councillor Herbert. Agreed. Councillor Holditch. Agreed. 
And Councillor Smith. Agreed. Okay, uh, and uh, therefore that's unanimous. So we move on uh, with uh, to item 1.7. Uh, again, this is appointments to executive committees and appointments of chairs and lead members. Uh, uh, Robert Parking, again, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, uh, this is, again is a relatively straightforward covering report. Um, simply noting the, nom the mayor's nominations uh, for lead member responsibilities. Uh, those are those should be with members of the the board uh, 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 now for for consideration. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, if members have any questions or comments, please raise your hands. Uh, Councillor Bowden. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, may I just point out that uh, Penland District Council won't be holding its annual meeting for another two weeks yet, so the names which are there should be regarded as provisional as best assessed at the moment. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? So again, I'm moving from the chair. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor uh, Bowden, Councillor Adams, uh, uh, Councillor Bailey and Mr Adams. Uh, so we'll go with Councillor Bowden as he was first up. Uh, and uh, again, we'll read out the names. Uh, Mr Adams. Approved. Uh, Councillor Bailey. Approved. Uh, Councillor Bowden. Agreed. Councillor Count. Agreed. Uh, Councillor Fuller. Agreed. Uh, Councillor Herbert. Agreed. Councillor Holditch. Agreed. And Councillor Smith. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, and therefore we move on to item 1.8, which is the overview and scrutiny. And again, Mr Parkin, uh, I turn to you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. So the report is seeking uh, to, uh, to have a confirmation by the board of the size of the overview and scrutiny committee being 14 members, two from each constituent council, with two substitute mem members for the next municipal year agreeing the political balance as described in the appendix to the uh, report to confirm the appointment of member and substitute member nominated by the constituent councils. Uh, there's a repetition there and, uh, and also to request, uh, it is a request to the overview and scrutiny committee that they consider the co-option of an independent member from a, from a constituent council as well. Um, and, and again, the, the uh, details are set out on the, uh, on the additional papers, uh, Appendix 1, which members should have before them. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Herbert, you've raised your hand. Uh, thanks. Um, I think it's really welcome that there's such a wide number of people contributing to the committees. My question is, having looked through the list, I, I start to see people who are both on main committees and also on the scrutiny committee. Um, when I took advice on that locally, um, it was that, that sh we shouldn't do that. Um, but if that is a practice that is now um, approved, um, uh, could we just have advice on that from Mr. Parkin? I, I very late emailed you about an hour and a half ago, but I appreciate you've probably been doing other things. Um, so I just want to clarity, is it the case that people can be both on the committee and also be on the scrutiny committee, scrutinising that committee. Mr. Parkin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and thank you, Councillor Herbert, for highlighting this, um, obviously a, a, an important point. Um, legally, um, in the setting of combined authority, um, the, the, the full extent of the Local Government Act 2000, which deals with scrutiny, doesn't apply quite in the same way. It does, however, raise the same potential practical issues in that it's, you, sh you know, my advice would be that if a member has been involved, as it were, in a decision, um, then actually being involved in the scrutiny of that decision becomes difficult. And my advice to the chair of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee will be uh, on that basis. Um, there isn't a hard and fast rule in the combined authority constitution, but what we can do to uh, enable the committees to be appointed, but to note that this may be an issue, is, is take it away and take, have a conversation with these, uh, the uh, Centre for Public Scrutiny uh, and see whether or not um, we need to come back to this board to seek uh, either amendments to the Constitution or request back to the constituent councils for nominations. Um, it feels, uh, given that we need to proceed on the debate, well, we have the nominations before us that, that, and it's important to, to appoint the committees. That may be the most practical means forward, Mr Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Herbert. 
Yeah, no, I, 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 for some people, this will be um, dancing on head of a pin type detail, but I'm just keen, um, as on other aspects of the Constitution, to uh, have a clear position. So I'd appreciate, uh, in due course, an update. Yep. Uh, well, Mr. Parkin, we'll we'll get the, the the appropriate advice, and we will come back to uh, to members with that. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I'm proposing again for moving from the chair. Uh, do I have a seconder, uh, please? Don't all rush. Um, but I will need one of you to second it. Ah, uh, I'm going to go for Austin Adams, who was who was first in. Um, uh, so therefore, uh, again, we will ask each voting member um, to uh, whether they support the recommendations, and we'll begin with Mr. Adams, Austin. Agreed. Uh, Councillor Bailey. Agreed. Councillor Bowden. Agreed. Councillor Count. Agreed. Councillor Fuller. Agreed. Councillor Herbert. Agreed. Councillor Holich. Agreed. And Councillor Smith. Agreed. Uh, and again, that's unanimous. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, we will now go on to item 1.9, which is the appointment of the Audit and Governance Committee. Uh, again, Mr. Parkin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> uh, in a similar vein, uh, this uh, report seeks to have confirmation of the size of the Audit and Governance Committee, uh, being eight members, uh, with one member and one substitute from each constituent council, and confirm the reappointments of the existing independent person for the next municipal year. Uh, to agree the political balance as described in Appendix 1 to the report and to confirm uh, the appointment of the member and substitute member nominated um, as set out in Appendix 2 uh, and to confirm a chair and vice chair of the Governance, Audit and Governance Committee for the next municipal year. Uh, the details are contained in the appendices to the report which members should have before them. Thank you Mr Matt. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, again, I will, uh, any comments from uh, the members at all? So again, I will move from the chair and I will need a seconder. Uh, Councillor Bowden. Uh, so we begin uh, with Mr. Adams. Approved. Uh, Councillor Bailey. Agreed. Councillor Bowden. Agreed. Councillor Count. Agreed. Councillor Fuller. Agreed. Councillor Herbert. Agreed. Councillor Holditch. Agreed. And Councillor Smith. Agreed. Again, that's unanimous, so thank you very much. Uh, we then go on to move, approve the calendar of meetings for 2021, uh, 2020 and 21. Again, uh, Mr. Parkin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this report is seeking the approval of the committee of the calendar of, of meetings. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is detailed in the supplement, the document provided to members. Um, We've already discussed the 24th of June um, uh, uh, points, and uh, I would also, for the guidance of the committee, like to confirm that the um, August board meeting, um, which is the next uh, meeting after that shown for the 24th, is uh, it will be the Wednesday, the 5th uh, of August 2020. And that's uh, all of these details have been fed back through the democratic services teams to the constituent councils. Um, thank you, Mr. Matt. Okay, thank you, Mr. Parkin. Any comments from members? Okay, uh, so I, uh, uh, I again, I'm recommending from the chair, so a seconder, please. I'll second, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, and as there were, uh, so Councillor Holditch, and as there were no no comments on this, uh, I will take it that uh, sorry, the board members. Sorry Mayor. sorry, Mayor, can I just confirm where we are? Sorry, I was just slightly distracted there by something. What item are we on at the moment? So we are we are on the, the to approving the calendar of meetings for 2020. That's fine. 2021. That's fine. Right, I'll jump ahead. Thank okay. you. Sorry. So are, are you sure you you're happy where we are? I'm happy Smith? with that. Yeah, happy okay. with that. Thank you. Thank you. So as I said, as, as nobody has indicated to speak, I will take it that the members are all in favour, and uh, with with Mr. Councillor Holders backing, uh, that's another unanimous uh, decision. So thank you very much, Mr. Parkin. Uh, item 1.11 is complaints policy, uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, Mr. Parkin, could you introduce the report? Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, um, the, it is a, a role for the Combined Authority Board to adopt the complaints procedure, um, uh, and the uh, report seeking the, um, uh, that uh, adoption and approval. 
um, and as well as uh, the uh, the act of uh, notifying the local government and the social care ombudsman uh, of, and to provide a copy of the uh, revised procedure uh, and also to note that uh, the MO has delegated authority to make changes that uh, or seeking the delegation to, to the MO to, to, to make any changes um, that come back from the uh, local government and social care ombudsman. I, I'd also confirm that this report has been through the audit and governance committee who've uh, approved it um, with um, some uh, small additions and for the assistance of members the uh, appendix has been marked up with tracked changes to indicate the differences um, between the uh, the old or the, the current uh, policy and the new one you members will see that the changes are, are, are not are not huge and hopefully are self-explanatory and happy to take any questions chair okay, uh, i've got an indication from councillor smith Thank you very much. Uh, so, so thank you for the uh, so for presenting this with track changes because it's uh, it's very helpful. Um, I would I'm going to request a change of wording or or possibly a removal. Uh, page seventy three, number five, where it says, "How do I make a complaint?" And the new wording says, "The combined authority will take a proportionate approach to the assessment, investigation, review of complaints." That's fine, and has an initial two stage policy. Um, all co com complaints received will be treated in confidence. And then the bit I take issue with is that it says, however, complainants who go public in the media may forfeit their right to un anonymity and their right to confidentiality. Now, it, depending on how you read that, that can sound like a threat. And I wonder whether there's some uh, conflict with our whistleblowing policies there. I mean, I think it, you know, it's obvious that if you go to the press, then you, you potentially um, you know, give, forfeit your right to anonymity. But reading it in this document reads, like, reads to me like a threat. And I think I would rather that was taken out at best uh, or reworded in such a way that it was uh, not open to misinterpretation. Do you actually have any words that you'd like to put in, Councillor Smith? I don't, I don't think it's needed. I think we could take out that last sentence. I think all complainants received will be treated in confidence. I think that's all we need to say. We, we are going to respect complainants' confidence. Um, you know, we aren't going to out people in the press because they've, they've gone to the press. I think that would be very poor practice. Um, you know, if people choose to go to the press, then, you know, they take their own take their own risk so i just don't think it's necessary uh, thank you uh mayor um yeah i have i having read the the um line and the presentation by councillor bridget smith um, i have sympathy with her point of view mm -hmm. um because there is a difference between um for example a whistleblower as an example highlighting their concerns to the public to make the public aware about their concerns and and somebody who actually highlights their concerns and publishes their name and that's probably the difference here so if a complainant complainant goes public in the media and the name is published then of course their anonymity uh, they have no right to anonymity not enough they have no right to us not using their name uh, in, in dealing with the, the media response. However, if something is published, I don't think we would be in the right to publish their name because it may be a case of them highlighting their view. It's, at this stage, it's only their view on what has occurred. So I, I do think, I'm not sure if we want it removed entirely, but I would um, suggest uh, ask that perhaps Kim or uh, um, Robert suggest some words that covers that eventuality. Okay, well, there's, there's the challenge, uh, uh, Mr. Parkin. Is there, is there a way that we can alleviate the concerns of Councillor Smith and Council? Uh, <clears throat> certainly, uh, so in terms of uh, the, the, the way of doing so, um, I can either take the point away, uh, Chair, as, uh, and seek that this that today's approval is subject to um, my consulting with you on, on wording that you're satisfied with. Um, in terms of looking at the text here and now, um, I think it is, is possible, uh, I've, I've certainly seen elsewhere, an addition of, of something that, that looks to apply a public interest test, uh, which, which is appropriately, um, uh, is, is an appropriate justification in some instances, uh, and I certainly take the point uh, and, and 
understand why members have concern. So I either uh, hesitate to try and draft at the moment um, with that line, we may, we may uh, drag the conversation on a little further. Um, alternatively, Mr May, you may be minded, should, should members of the committee agree that, um, that it's approved subject to my uh, addressing with yourself, Mr Mayor, to your satisfaction, or, or the Chief Executive, um, that line on anonymity. So, um, uh, satis uh, subject to uh, a, the, the clause on, on uh, anonymous complaints being refined to your satisfaction. That sounds reasonable to me. I've got Councillor Bowden and, and then Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I very much welcome the suggestion of incorporating a public interest test into that section. I think that's extremely helpful. Uh, the basic underlying intent of that uh, 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 point, however, is, I think, a quite valid one because in some councils there is the, uh, uh, the occurrence of individuals who attempt to use a complaint procedure for party political purposes and to then seek to reinforce that by also going to the press, thus uh, getting their case out into the public and almost condemning the person who is being subject to the complaint before the complaints procedure has even got to the person being complained about uh, to, to, for him to be, or her to be able to give their, their response. So I think that it is appropriate to keep this within the report, but having that public interest test uh, uh, exception in there, I think is really valuable. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Smith. Okay. Well, I must confess, I haven't thought about this at all in terms of um, people taking party political advantage. That wasn't, I was thinking about, you know, some poor resident with an issue um, being scared off from making a complaint. So I wasn't thinking along the same lines as Councillor Bowden at all. Um, I mean, obviously, the final decision uh, rests with you, Mayor, but I would hope that the uh, monitoring officer would uh, just informally run any uh, amendment, any alternative wording, past members of the committee as a, a courtesy, uh, as much as anything, just to give us a second opportunity just to comment. Well, absolutely, and as you know, uh, Councillor Smith, this is a democracy, and, and, and I wouldn't think of it any other way. Uh, Councillor Count. Thank you, Mayor. Totally happy uh, to go away uh, for Robert to consult with you uh, on the um, on the appropriate wording um, and to address the the recommendations to have subject to um, a delegation in that matter. I think uh, the way to report back to us will be it will be as an action at the next committee, so we're going to all see the final adoption of that particular sentence, uh, and and that's that dealt with. Uh, very happy with that. Thank you. Yep, I'm entirely happy with that. So with that uh, slight amendment, uh, Mr Parkin, I will, uh, and members, I will, um, Councillor Smith, you want to come back again? No, okay. Uh, uh, so with, with that uh, minor adjustment, uh, I will, I again will um, recommend from the Chair, do I have a seconder? One of you? Ah, Councillor Bowden, good. Uh, and uh, as everybody seems to again be in agreement, I will take it that unless somebody raises their hand now, they are not. And uh, rather than go through individually, we will we will say that's a unanimous uh, uh, decision again. Agreed. Uh, item item one point one two is the performance report. Uh, Mr. Parkin gets some time off now, and we go to Roberta Fulton. Roberta. Hello. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillors. So as part of the agenda pack, members have received the updated performance report, which includes an overview on delivery as at the end of April 2020. Appendix 1 also supports this report and continues to be updated following the format of report performance reporting that was approved by board members at the Combined Authority Board meeting in November 2019. Uh, the appendix continues to provide detail on how the area is delivering against our key metrics, which are GVA, jobs and housing, and these are the three graphs that you can see at the top of the report. In addition to this metric data, appendix one also includes the RAG status of the combined authorities' key projects at the bottom, um, and again updated at, as at the end of April, as well as the overall movement of projects and a number of red rated projects across the entire portfolio. Uh, as you can see from this report, there is a net movement or downward movement of two projects. There's six projects decreasing in status and two and four projects improving, sorry. And there are also three red rated projects across the entire portfolio. Uh, 
uh, these RAG statuses continue to be updated, at, updated as part of our standard management processes. Um, and members would be interested to hear that since the end of April, the contract for King Stipe project has been signed and this has now become green. There are therefore no more red rated key projects. The next update will be brought to the September meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, uh, Councillor Herbert. Yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't want the meeting to go past without me raising a question on this item. Um, I think it's really useful to have the RAG rating. Um, clearly, there's several projects that, that are at amber, and that is a wide range of issues between green and red. So um, I just appreciate a bit, a bit more on those uh, projects. Um, if we could just briefly, if it's possible for the officer to uh, give us a, 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 a short summary. Um, I haven't seen Mr. Rains for a while, and obviously he's been introducing this report, so I also just hope that he's well and uh, 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 look forward to seeing him in the future. Okay, uh, I'll go back to Roberta to, to address those points. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you. Um, I, absolutely. I can um, speak to the offices of those Amber projects and ask that a, an update is provided for those shortly after this meeting, if that's okay with you. I think the overall uh, background is that we haven't may have had a report on our overall transport priorities for a while. Um, and given that aspects like Wisbeach Rail and A47 obviously interlink, as do other transport improvements like the A10 and other projects, it would just be really good to um, see how they all link up and where they're at because by itself, the red, amber, green rating doesn't indicate how close the projects are to securing the major funding that they will need to proceed. So um, um, can I just make a request that when we get this report in future that we at least have a couple of lines on each of the uh, amber or red projects as we've had in the update, very welcome update on King's Dyke, um, but that we also have a report on updating us on where the transport strategy key projects are um, at one of the upcoming meetings. Yes, uh, we, we, will, we will note that uh, the point has been made, uh, Councillor Herbert, and also I will make sure that members are all, all updated uh, uh, in due course by, uh, by Mr. Raines on, uh, on exactly where we are on those, uh, on those amber and red projects. Okay. So we've Thanks. been asked to note uh, the June delivery dashboard and, and that's been done. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, uh, Roberta. And we move on to uh, part two, which is finance. Um, uh, and the budget monitor report will be introduced by John also. John. Okay. Um, thank you, thank you, Mayor. Um, this budget update report contains um, three recommendations. Um, firstly, to ask the board to note the provisional outturn position against the budget for the year to 31st of March 2020. Um, these will be subject to adjustments um, as we progress um, uh, during the year-end close-down um, procedures. And also um, uh, for any adjustments that come to light um, during the the audit of the, the financial statement, which, which is, is currently un underway. So there may be some uh, changes to these figures, but we will up the, uh, update the board on those at the next um, board meeting. The second recommendation is to approve the carry forward of some budget underspends to into um, the next financial year, the current financial year, 2020-21. For example, um, where there has been slippage um, and where the budget is needed to be carried forward to complete the, the project. And again, um, these will be subject to um, year-end uh, adjustments. And thirdly, um, is for the board to consider the update to the 2020-21 budget and the medium-term financial plan in accordance with um, proposed change, uh, proposed changes as part of the review of the MTFP, which was a commitment made at the March meeting um, to, to look at the impact of, of, of COVID-19. Um, so if I can just draw your attention to the table in uh, under paragraph 3.1. Um, this shows the, um, the revenue income and expenditure um, draft outturn position. 
So the, the provisional outturn position is that it's, it's showing a, a favourable variance against the revenue budget for the year of 6.7 million. Um, with the majority of the expenditure lines showing a favourable variance and at the bottom of the table there you can see that the uh, again the majority of the work stream headings show some element of, of carry forward either because they are ring fenced budgets or ring fenced uh, funding or um, they are required to, to complete project work going forward um, and details of all the material variances are shown in appendix three um, so in terms of the revenue carry forward, the, the general principle is that where there isn't a ring fenced funding stream or where um, committed expenditure is, is required to continue into the next um, financial year, that underspends are taken corporately so that they can, re, uh, they can be reprioritized um, in, in, in accordance with the, uh, across the whole of the organization. So the proposed material carry forwards are detailed um, under paragraph 4.2 and a line by line breakdown can be seen of the variances and carry forwards um, in appendix one. Um, so the, the provision under spend for revenue is 6.7 million and if we were to carry forward all of the, uh, the, um, uh, the suggested um, balances to carry forward um, that would result in 5.1 million of this being transferred into the new financial year, leaving a net underspend of 1.6 million pounds against the approved budget, which um, would be reflected in, the, in, in an increase in the authority's reserves going forward. In terms of capital, um, we are showing um, these are these are highlight these are shown in appendix two, but we're overall we're showing a third approximately a 32 million pounds favorable variance of outturn against budget um, and the majority of this is either ring fenced for example in the uh, the Cambridge City housing fund or um, is requested to be carried forward um, and again details are shown in in uh, appendix three um, and indeed the majority of the, the variances on capital budgets are uh, as a result of expenditure profiles changing rather than representing a true saving um, or uh, underspend due to scope change or for example, where there have been efficiencies. Um, so under section uh, 5.3, we are showing um, where material variances are not being asked to, to, be, to be carried forward. In terms of the, um, the, the priorities review, at the meeting held on the 25th of March, um, board received an urgent report setting out how the combined authority plan to support recovery to the area um, through immediate short-term and medium-term responses to the, uh, the COVID-19. Um, this, um, this included an undertaking to review all key priorities to, ident to identify risks and also to focus on those projects which will best support economic recovery going forward. Um, we've now carried out um, a full review of the MTFP um, with, with, with directors to look at short-term risks, uh, opportunities to enable funding to be repurposed priorities, um, which will contribute, contribute to economic improvement. And we've also um, reviewed and updated assumptions made in the medium-term financial plan on the funding of projects, which highlights the promoter role of the combined authority um, in lobbying central government to obtain future funding commitments uh, and that's enabled us to release some previously earmarked funds which were shown as subject to approval in the MTFP. Um, for example um, Cambridge South State Station which will have an impact on our reserves um, uh, both revenue and capital funding going forward. So in terms of the, uh, the, the proposed remodeled um, medium term financial plan, um, we have, uh, we've, uh, we've built in all of the impacts, the potential impacts that, of the suggestions and um, the, the MTFP is, now, is still affordable. It um, refocuses funds towards the immediate COVID-19 response. 
um, and it's enabled the release of some resources to support economic recovery. So, for example, an increased commitment in market towns and um, to earmark funding to support the development of the, the CAM up to the delivery of the um, outline business uh, case stage and also to include uh, potential funding for some initial cost of the full business case. Um, just to confirm that all of these are suggestions, if they are approved, um, they would still be, sh uh, be um, shown as subject to approval in the MTFP, which, which will mean that we will still need to come back to the board with business cases in order to get um, approval in order to spend going forward. So in terms of the, um, the proposed savings and the new investments, those are all highlighted under paragraph 6.14. Um, and just to indicate uh, the tables on uh, under um, paragraph 6.14, there are two, uh, they may not be terribly easy to, to read there, but that gives an indication both in terms of revenue and in terms of capital of the impact of these changes um, if they were uh, to be adopted within the MTFP. So the top line, um, for example, on the revenue um, uh, table there shows the baseline position. So, and that is based on the assumption that, um, that the, uh, of the, 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 the revenue um, funds um, based on the assumption that the, 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 the financial year that has just passed um, is, uh, is in, in accordance with the budget. So any um, additional savings on top of that will go to improve our overall funding position. And at the bottom line there, um, the cells to look at is in terms of e the end of each financial year um, across the, the NTFP, we are still in, in credit. So that demonstrates that if we were to take these forward, um, each of those, uh, those, those measures would still enable the, the MTFP to be balanced and affordable going forward. Um, happy to take any, any questions. Uh, members, the forum is open. Uh, Councillor Herbert. Um, uh, thank you to Mr. Olsock for his um, usual um, highly detailed and uh, clear reporting. Um, on each of the, our sort of main programmes on uh, economic work, on transport, and on uh, the wider programme of uh, business and skills, um, we're a hundred. Well, so we're one point five million pound. Uh, underspent. Now, I, I can understand from an accountant's point of view that's a positive variance, but um, they are significant underspends, and I, I know that that a lot of that happened before the current um, uh, concerns. So, um, I, I obviously, like all public authorities, we, we've got challenges. Um, but I just would ask that um, perhaps as part of our informal discussions ahead of um, a future meeting that we actually do have a hard look Mayor, at the budget because along with the challenges that we need to address coming out of the epidemic, um, I just think that there are opportunities for us to um, rethink some of those projects. Um, uh, I, while I'm speaking, I, I also note that there's uh, some significant new lines in the budget both on revenue and capital for the Cambridge Metro project and it's a project that we uh, continue and have stated support for um, and I just wondered under what uh, what level of detail uh, underlies post-tunnel funding of outline business case uh, work of about two and a half million you said mayor that you're now not expecting the outline business case to be coming to the combined authority until at least the autumn. Um, innovation company, 4.4 million um, uh, revenue plus 2.2 uh, million capital over two years. Um, special purpose delivery vehicle, um, 15 million, um, and another 3 million for the outline business or for the full business case. Um, at what stage, Mayor, will we be getting fuller reports on these? Because these add up to a total of 30 million, which um, is very well 
welcome in that it underlines that next stage is getting commitment. But but we obviously need to see exactly how much uh, this is uh, a costing and how it's directed. Um, it's a, a very expensive overall project, but um, we we also um, yeah, we just need to understand what the next stages are, Mayor, um, and also how that links to the funding aspect, because it's critical um, that along with getting support from government, um, there is a funding plan for the CAM Metro. Thanks. Yeah, and um, appreciate that, Councillor Herbert. I mean, just, just to go to your first point about retraining uh, and, and money in the budget for that, there is an item 3.5 on the agenda which I think is, uh, it will, will go way, some way to, to helping that question be answered. I think the points you made on CAM Metro, as, as you, I'm sure you're aware, there is a meeting of the CAM board on, uh, on the 9th of June, and then there is a meeting of the leaders of this authority on the 10th of June, uh, where we'll go into a significant amount of detail about the, the, the options that we have. Uh, as you said, uh, we have put forward a, a clear balanced budget with the ability to deliver the next stage of CAM Metro. And, uh, um, Yes, it's a, uh, you know, CAM Metro is uh, an expensive project, but it's also, as we're completely aware, a joined up project, not, uh, not um, uh, individual bits of a project. It's a joined up project to prove, prove a solution. And uh, I'm sure you're aware how difficult it is uh, to work on schemes that aren't joined up. So it's important that we, we move to the next stage of CAM Metro. But of course, that will be with the approval of the members of this board. And I wouldn't expect you to make that decision about the details in front of you, and as you are aware, we are, we are, we have, we have meeting schedules for that. Um, Councillor Smith. Sorry, just briefly. Oh, sorry, Councillor. Sorry. Sorry, briefly. Thank you for that. And obviously, um, we, um, we, I under underline, as you've said, the importance of the CAM Partnership Board because it hasn't met since February, and it it, it has put an awful lot of work into uh, uh, work this, and and we fully support it. Um, and then we will hear from them from following their meeting next week and have informal meetings um, in bringing this forward. I, the, it, I just mentioned that, 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 that these sums are, are pretty sketchy at the moment and obviously we, we want the project to succeed, we want it to gain funding, but we do need to see how this money is being used and for what purpose. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Herbert. Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Mr. Alstock for a, uh, a, an intelligible report. It is, uh, it is a joy to uh, read finance reports that uh, I can understand easily. Um, I've got two questions. One relates to 3.2, which uh, makes reference to uh, monies that aren't carried over being returned to the original funder. Uh, could I have clarification about whether any money has or is going back to funders and whether any money is at risk of going back to funders? And then my second question uh, relates to uh, 6.7, which says investment in the CAM is an investment in recovery. And we've had an indications from the Oxcam Art that they're keen to support transformational infrastructure projects such as this in the area. I just want to query about recovery. So CAM's not going to be delivered for quite a long time. And I kind of hope that we will have recovered and COVID will be a dim and unpleasant memory to us by the time we're all getting on the, the infrastructure that is, uh, is the CAM. So I'm just interested to know um, about what conversations have taken place with the OxCAM and what these, you know, what these indications of them supporting CAM as part of recovery are, because I'm, I'm not sure that's you know, entirely an accurate statement. Though I, you know, I know OxCAM are very keen on, on innovation, but it's just the link with recovery. As I say, I rather hope we are well recovered by then. Well, I, I agree. And uh, before I bring Mr. also in on your technical point, I'll answer the political one first. And I agree entirely that by the time CAM is built, that, that COVID-19 will, uh, will be a distant memory for all of us and, uh, and a distant nightmare, I hope. But I would also say that it's very important at this time uh, for authorities such as the Command Authority to show their intention to support the business community in Cambridgeshire by being bold, and innovative and, and there is no bolder or more innovative scheme in the UK than, than CAM Metro and uh, uh, as you're well aware uh, Councillor Smith uh, the, the requirement from government for, for the ARC is to be bold and innovative in your transport solutions that will add to the ability of, of, of the ARC to be successful and I know 
how how keen you are on on a carbon neutral and agree the green agenda for the arc obviously you are fully aware that that's that's the case of the metro and and ultimately the arc will not be a success in the cambridge area unless it is linked in appropriately with the rest of the area uh, and that's through cam metro they are uh, symbiotic i believe in in their uh, uh, in in their importance so uh, that's the political answer councillor smith and i would bring uh, Mr. Olsop on uh, in uh, for your 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 point on I think it was item three point two. Um, yes, thank you, um, uh, Councillor Smith. Um, we are not aware of any um, any funds that will be going back to um, to fund this at, at this stage. All of the conditions that have been um, that uh, needed to be to be done are not are not going to impact on on any carry forwards at, at this stage. But um, we will update you if that if that changes. Thank you very much, Mr. Altov. Um, thank you, Mayor. I accept your, um, your, your explanation there. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Council. Yes, uh, th thank you, Mayor. A um, bit, bit of di disappointment today. Um, you, you're, you should be you're aware, Mayor, um, that uh, my name is on this report. However, I wasn't involved in the drawing up of this report. It was left at too late notice for me to be involved. Um, there were discussions with John Alsop and uh, Kim Sawyer regarding my involvement in this and uh, the last communication I had was it would be made clear at the start of this report that I wasn't uh, instrumental in drawing this report, it was yourself and John Alsop and that hasn't been made clear, been made clear. so I need to, to make that clear. I, I have no problems at all with the report balancing, the, the numbers add up. So as a purely functioning balance sheet report, it is, it is a balanced report. Um, the questions I had, which were quite a number when it was presented to me, um, have not, we've not uh, fully ironed them out and there was not enough time to fully them, iron them out or write the report in a different way. So, so therefore it, it's appropriate that you and John uh, report, put this report forward and report it in this way. And as I say, I don't have any problems with the balance here. The, the main things that I had, if it was my report, which it isn't, if it was my report, the main difficulties I have was the way that the monies were reallocated um, at this stage. So there's a huge amount of uh, reallocation, uh, just under £40 million pounds from underspends into other projects. Now, as a matter of process, if I, if I was um, dealing with this, the way I would deal with this is when the uh, underspends were identified, uh, say on a transport uh, permit uh, report. So there are projected underspends in the descoping of the um, third uh, river crossing at Huntington Shear. There's the projects coming out of the Fenland um, network stations. There are there are um, uh, other projects that are adjusted downwards, I would have thought that they would go to uh, a transport committee or, or the, the appropriate committee to see if that's the appropriate, if they are underspending, if it's agreed that they underspend, and if they are underspending what happens, what their recommendation is for the money, and for the board to really decide when the money comes in, what to do and where to reallocate this money. But it's been reallocated at director's level with uh, 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 without the members involvement at all to see if that's okay with a huge amount going into the CAM project um, basically coming away from uh, other areas so I wouldn't have tackled the report in that way I would have put it back into the uh, funds that they came from and then as and when decisions came forward with the blessing of the board and perhaps the subcommittees take those decisions and reallocate them um, the rationale used for this was to show that it is fully affordable, the projects are fully affordable, and I totally understand that, that, that is what this budget does. It shows it is uh, affordable, however it now has a huge amount of uh, budget lines saying subject to approval from a board, and that is uh, very much these are lined up against budgets for which they were, are proposed to be allocated, but that may not have happened that way if it was done the other way around. Um, I have concerns about the CAM budget because what we've now got is over £30 million going there and the allocations that are um, indicated against them is to, for a uh, secondary uh, outline business case, uh, further work on that, which I'm unaware of. Um, but then it says some of the money for the full business case and it just, you know, it seems like uh, it's left hanging there with, that, with the, what does some of the money uh, mean? 
So uh, on the basis of that, uh, I've asked all my questions uh, offline. I'm waiting for the answers of them. I have no problems with um, with uh, the actual addition. I have no problems with the port going forward in this way. Um, however, I wanted to be make, make it clear that as the lead uh, member, I was not involved in drawing this up. And as such, and as my name remains on the front of this, and that wasn't cleared up, I'm going to have to abstain. I'm not going to vote against because there's nothing wrong with the addition, uh, but I'm not going to vote in favour because it wouldn't have been the way I would have brought it forward. And it's incorrect in the fact that it's got my name on the front. And that is a position, I must say, I made very clear all the while at the start of the formation of the combined authority. If I'm asked to do a task, I want to be fully involved and do that task. And, and if I'm not fully involved, then, then I, and I can't contribute, then I can't have my name associated. Uh, so thank you for your time and I'll be abstaining. Okay, I appreciate that, Mr. Uh, St Stephen. Uh, the reality is that the Command Authority Board asked us to, to come up with solutions to uh, uh, deal with an immediate issue. And uh, this immediate issue is, is quite important, I think you will agree. And what we've been able to do is repurpose money from, from projects where, although there was allocation, uh, those projects were sitting in a dormant position and invest an enormous amount of money directly directly into the, the economy of Cambridgeshire uh, and that money will be coming it will be available to invest in the economy of Cambridgeshire in the very short term through our market towns provision so whilst uh, I, you know I, I apologize that your name is on the report uh, the, the fact is that in a very busy time for all authorities these decisions were required by this board and they were quite required to be made sensibly uh, and appropriately which is exactly what the officer team and myself did uh, as you said, uh, Council Account, the numbers add up entirely. The budget is, is entirely balanced and it absolutely commits to the future of this county. So uh, I'm disappointed that uh, you will abstain, although, of course, I understand you're not abstaining because there is a problem with, with the report. But I am disappointed with that position. Uh, this authority has to, has to continue and has to run on a daily basis and sometimes decisions have to be made uh, with the effect of the, uh, the current situation, and that's exactly what this is. Uh, Councillor Smith. And Mr. Mr. Mayor, if I could just very quickly, if, if your indulgence, just on the administrative point of the correction on the, on the decision report, um, this was highlighted to us, and we took steps as an officer team <clears throat> to update the report in line with, with, with the comments that Councillor Count had made. And I'm looking online at the report itself and I'm seeing yourself, Mr. Mayor, as the lead member. Um, so uh, I can only apologise if that hasn't got through uh, in, into, into the updates to members. Um, and and I'm, 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 I have to say I'm confounded as to why it's showing um, a separate report. Um, we did certainly take that on board um, and certainly sought to, 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 to take that into account. So... Um, I can only apologise if it's not come through. I, could, I, I would confirm that we certainly did seek to take active steps to do that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Parkin. Uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you. So, so that's that's quite concerning. Um, so, I just really wanted some clarification over what is the actual sort of roles and responsibility, really, of all our subcommittees. Um, I mean, I know there's been discussion before um, about the housing committee, about um, items that seem to jump directly to, board, to board, the board rather than uh, being based at, the, at that committee. Um, but, you know, what is the status of the, fi of the finance committee if, um, you know, the, the, lead, the lead member isn't having a role in these, these papers? Well, there isn't a finance committee, uh, councillors. Uh, whatever, it, well, the, the committee that's... Uh, uh, well, so, well, council accounts, you know, council accounts role. Oh, sorry, I've something funny's happened here with my screen. Um, okay. Council accounts role um, seems to be unclear. Not really, uh, Mr. Parkin, do you want to come in and answer that, please? Um, uh, I, th I think, uh, as, uh, as, as sorry, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, it may be something that John wishes to comment on, but clearly, a, a lead member for a, a particular area um, as designated. Um, will be a part of an, uh, the, the preparation and, and um, proposal that comes before the board in relation to it. Um, that, that notwithstanding, of course, Mr. Mayor, um, uh, everything falls to you as the mayor, so, so otherwise would, would be matters for you. So uh, again, uh, thinking back to the, um, to the note online, which does confound me, uh, um, that, that's all I'd say. I don't know if John wants to add in about some of that preparation work. 
And now, obviously, I've spoken to, to Councillor Count about this, and um, I, I just want to reassure him that um, that going forward, we will make sure that um, that there is appropriate time, and um, uh, that we can uh, to take on board all of of, of his his, uh, his comments, and that we have sufficient time in order to deal with any of the questions um, before papers are, are, are published. Thank you, uh, Councillor Herbert. Um, just a couple of brief comments. Um, I'm uh, grateful for the comments uh, in response to um, the points, um, including from John Olsop, because I do think, um, uh, given the range of issues that we've dealt with, that there's been a really big contribution from um, Councillor Counts. Um, I, I do think that when we look at um, in detail at the proposed budget items for Cambridge and Metro, um, we need to look really hard at them and work out how much we need to commit now. Um, and as I raised earlier in the meeting, I think we've kind of lost track of some of the other transport priorities. So I do think we need to set the decisions on CAM Metro in that wider context. I think we've got about 10 different priority transport projects, um, effectively creating a grid of road and rail, north, south, east and west. And I'd, I'd like us to come back and have a hard look at that, James, because that is really important, Mayor, for, um, for the whole county. Yeah, um, we certainly haven't lost uh, track of our transport priorities. Uh, you will see it's obviously clear from the budget that we are still committed to those transport priorities. Uh, all of them are in the budget. The, the money that we have reassigned is from projects that were dormant. Uh, or, or had reached a point where there was no funding necessary to be to be held aside. Uh, and uh, as I said, this this uh, this this budget uh, is uh, is a reaction to a request from this board, uh, and that's what we we have done. And as I said again, it will allow us to put significant amounts of money into the Cambridgeshire economy in the short term. But it absolutely does not renege on our transport commitment. So I'm not sure where where you've found that, Councillor Herbert, but it's not in the papers in front of you. So I have uh, no more speakers, uh, so I will therefore go to the vote. Uh, I, I would like to propose this from the Chair. Uh, do I have a second? Please? Second to Mr Mayor. Councillor Holditch. Uh, and so we will go first to uh, Mr Adams. Uh, you in favour? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bailey. Agreed. Uh, Councillor Bowden. Uh, Councillor Count. Abstain. Uh, Councillor Fuller. Agreed. Uh, Councillor Herbert. Can't hear you, Councillor Herbert. Apologies. Abstain. Councillor Hol uh, Councillor Holditch. Agreed. And Councillor Smith. Abstain. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, that is carried, and uh, I will now now uh, I will now move on to uh, combined authority matters. Um, item three point one, Cambridge City Council seventy million pounds affordable housing program forecast. Uh, Mr. Thompson, I believe you are taking this report. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this paper is requesting approval to the projected budget budget expenditure under the 70 million Cambridge City Affordable Housing Programme for the year 2020-21. Uh, programme expenditure for the year 2021 is projected to be £20,536,518 and approval is requested to enable quarterly payments to be made during the financial year. Incorporated within this budget is £5.26 million from the year 2019-2020 budget uh, that we are requesting be carried forward and incorporated into the budget for year 2021. I recommend the paper to the board. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Herbert was in before Mr Thompson even finished uh, to get his point across, so Councillor Herbert. Very briefly, just um, uh, 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 Mr Thompson's report. Um, uh, yes, some of our sites have been um, in lockdown, so the supply materials as well as um, actual building uh, in a safe distancing way was limited but um, uh, we've got an active uh, building program and we'll be back in the next few weeks on a number of those sites um, and the, the homes are badly needed. Thank you Matt. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bowden. Yeah, I very much welcome the comment in the report that there is a low risk of the target of 500 starts not being achieved by March 2022. Uh, however, obviously with COVID-19 and the uh, currently unknown implications that it will have, that is something which will need to continue to be monitored and to be reported back to this board. And in fact, if it does get to the stage of not being a low risk anymore, but being a higher risk, I think it is really important that that uh, is brought to the attention not merely of the Housing Committee, but also of this board. Uh, I do note that 4.1 million pounds of spending profile has been uh, shifted from 21-22 to 22-23. And I understand why that's been done. Uh, and it's not in itself a problem, so long as we achieve the 500 starts by March 2022. But there is a limit to how much we can continue to move the budget further to the right without potentially risking that 500 start. So it is something that we need to keep an eye on. Thank you. Uh, any further comments? So we'll then uh, again uh, move the recommendations to the chair. Do I have a seconder, please? Oh, well. Uh, Councillor Holditch. Um, and we move first to, uh, I haven't heard anybody talk again, so I assume that you're all going to be in favour. So uh, unless anybody wants to put their hand up now, we will, we will, we will take that as a unanimous vote. Okay, thank you. Um, item 3.2 is Wisbeach Rail. Uh, Anna Graham. Thank you. The purpose of this paper is to update the board members on progress with the Wisbeach Rail full business case and the Governance for Rail Investment Projects 3B study. The full business case builds on the outline business case completed in 2015 by further developing options and coming to a preferred single option. The FBC has been carried out in conjunction with um, rail scheme feasibility and design commensurate with Network Rail's Grip 3B. It's currently in final draft and will be published in due course. The draft FBC concludes that the most commercially viable solution is a heavy rail service serving a station centrally located within Wisbeach. A two trains per hour service should run between Wisbeach and Cambridge to reach the highest benefit cost ratio. In order to run through uh, to Cambridge, train paths through the busy Ely Junction need to be available. Uh, we believe that capacity for an hourly direct service uh, may be already available um, prior to the enhancements proposed within the Ely Area Capacity Enhancements Project. Um, securing further capacity increases through that project will form part of our engagement with the Department for Transport. The economic case concludes that the uh, core scenario of the heavy rail option, including wider benefits, has a benefit cost ratio of between 2 and 2.5, which is classed as high. The infrastructure cost data has yet to be finalised, but there was a table provided within the paper, but I have to highlight that this is subject to change as we finalise the report. The financial case concludes that while there is scope for financing some elements of the scheme locally and through the fare box, significant national grant funding will be required to enable the delivery of this project. The FBC and GRIP 3B has met the original scope to identify a single option solution, establish a, set, a station location and an alternative means of crossing the existing level crossings. The Restoring Railways funding offers the best opportunity for national grant funding. We are currently, we are trying to uh, have discussions with DFT about how to progress the project through the accelerating existing proposals funding which focuses on projects uh, with a business case already in place. Subject to approval by the Co Combined Authority Board, as per recommendation B, um, Combined Authority Officers will meet with DFT, ORR and Network Rail officials um, to present the outcome of the full business case and GRIP 3. Um, we hope that this would take place in July 2020. And I, recommend, um, I commend this uh, paper to the Board. Okay, thank you very much. Um, comments, please. Councillor Bowden. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you very much indeed, Anna, for that, uh, uh, that commentary. I'm more than happy to support the three recommendations that we have before us today. And this really is quite a historic paper. 
in that it brings us closer to getting a restored rail link to Wisbeach than we have been at any time in the last 52 years since that rail link was lost. I do support the willingness of the CPCA to continue to lead on this project, even if using the so-called hybrid approach of working with National Rail as far as delivery is concerned. Members may or may not be aware that Wisbeach is one of the largest towns in the entire country to be without a rail link, and it's the second largest community in Eastern region to be without a rail link. And when we see the Spear report and see how it says it's so important for us to reduce inequalities between the north and the south of the combined authority area, having the, uh, the uh, benefit of having the uh, rail link restored will really will make a difference. Wisbeach uh, is, the most, is the most deprived town, uh, at least as far as the index of multiple deprivation is concerned, it's by far the most deprived town in the combined authority area. And the economic and housing expansion, which are desperately needed in Wisbeach, are absolutely dependent upon better transport links. So I'd like to thank uh, Anna, I'd like to thank you, Mayor, and also Paul Rains for this report. And I very much hope that we continue to move forward. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Bowden. Uh, Councillor Count. Uh, thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, great news to see it get this far with a positive BCR that's, that it's got behind it to back it. Um, I, I raised with you privately, I, I'm slightly concerned it, it can, it's come to the board in its unfinished form uh, and still has to actually be finalised through the Transport Committee and I'd like to have seen the full finalised case come to the board but I can understand the merits of doing this so that we highlight this as early as possible. Um, moving forward, so we now have a, a strong case, uh, a, as far as I can tell, from this um, GRIP 3B study to build the Whiz Beach Railway now, because the biggest, um, the biggest problem with the Whiz Beach Rail has been the blockage at Ely North in getting the trains to and from Cambridge. And I've felt in the past that we would never have a positive BCR without the Cambridge element introduced. However, the report in front of us clearly indicates that we can run an interim solution at this present point in time without Ely North being dealt with, build that so we've got the, 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 the service up and running now and that also has a positive BCR. So there's no reason apart from money to stop this going forward. And when I say apart from money, let's be honest, 218 million pounds is nothing to be sniffed at. It's a huge sum of money, but like all these projects, it's not the quantum of money that is the most important. It's whether it makes sense financially to spend it. And with a positive BCR, it makes sense for the British government to spend money here in, in the Cambridgeshire and in the Wisbeach area. And I must add that it, it meets one of the core aims of both the CPO report and the combined authority in equalizing those areas of multiple deprivation with those that are more affluent and have better outcomes. And those are things that we um, really built into the CPCA core reason for being right at the start of our negotiations with government. And I fully expected a BCR to come in quite low around the one or possibly even 0.95 and be using that exclusion that we built into the CPCA governance where we could say that there's a good reason to invest here. It may not be great financially, but it's great for social reasons. So I'm delighted that we don't actually have to play that part. It just makes great financial sense. The issue now is where do we get the money? And there's a, there's a way forward with that. We go to the committee first to, to see the finalized report, sign that off and assuming it makes no great difference to the BCRs, then engage with government uh, through the DFT, et cetera, and look at this funding report. Um, for me, that, that's fine and it's probably the right way forward. But in terms of our project delivery, it doesn't, it doesn't tell me as a board member when I'm going to hear about it next. And I've spoken to you privately, and I know that you're happy, Mayor, if we put a time period of six months for it to come back to the board for an update report, 
uh, and hopefully we'll have something positive. Obviously, if, it's, if you get something more positive, we'll hear it before then, but if not, to update us on where those discussions are in, in six months time. Um, because you know, at, the, at this point in time, we don't have to wait for Cambridge North, not according to this paper. So I really hope that we'll get some positive news out of government. And if not, we'll have to think, where's the money gonna come from? Because according to this, we need to build this and we need to build this now. So thank you for indulging me. Uh, I'll be very keen to support this and great work. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Councillor Count. Uh, quite happy to come back for six months. Uh, obviously, uh, I would like to come back sooner, but we have to see what impact uh, the COVID uh, situation has on the government's uh, uh, forward planning and forward spending. I, I will just put one point, Councillor Council, that you made that the biggest problem has been Ely North Junction, which absolutely it has, but alongside that, we've not had a proper business case to take to government. And that's the fundamental difference here. We have a grip three business case, as you said, with a positive PCR, uh, and that makes a significant difference. Councillor Holditch. Still can't hear you, Councillor Holditch. That mute button is stubborn. Yeah, I, you, I think you've just put it right. I think Councillor Count said Cambridge North twice, and it's Ely North Junction that's the problem. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, Ely North, Ely North. I'm sure he. I'm sure it was a Freudian slip. Okay, uh, so we have uh, um, uh, no more speakers. I, again, I'm happy to move from the chair. Do I have a seconder? Second. No, Councillor Holditch. Um, and again, there are no speakers again. So rather than go through laboriously and ask you all, uh, I will uh, I will go and say uh, unless uh, somebody puts their hand up sharpish, we will say that it's a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted to see that come through. Uh, it was a key uh, project for for the command authority and for myself as mayor from day one to get to this stage, and uh, we will be calling on government to help us get beyond. Uh, item three point three is Peterborough. Uh, transport schemes and we have a question from uh, uh, the, this report from uh, Councillor Price uh, and uh, Councillor Price the floor is yours. Uh, yes thank you Mayor. Um, so the question um, from the overview and scrutiny committee is um, there is an increased emphasis on active transport modes and an increased level of importance attached to cycling, walking and equestrian transport as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. What steps are being taken to prioritise active travel, not only in the light of COVID-19, but more generally? Okay, thank you, Councillor Price. So the active travel is a priority for the Command Authority uh, and for our local transport plan. And the likely effects of COVID-19 on travel choices have made urgent short-term interventions to support active travel necessary. Uh, uh, and I ask the highways authorities uh, to develop a package of such measures at the beginning of May, uh, and I have to commend both Peter and Cambridge uh, councils on, on their highways teams and how hard they work to get the work to government and to the Prime Minister quickly. Um, uh, and that package, uh, uh, the first of those measures from those packages are already being implemented. And then there's uh, later in the report, there's an urgent report to today's board, which sets out details of how that work is being funded and led. Um, and, you know, I certainly hope uh, to be able to uh, uh, begin to draw more money down from the government's significant pot for active travel. Okay, thank you, Councillor Price. Uh, so we will therefore move to Anna Graham again. Anna. Thank you. The purpose of this paper is to request the release of funding for the 2020-21 financial year to enable Peterborough City Council to undertake initial transport studies. On the 28th of March 2018, the Combined Authority approved funding for scheme studies and monitoring to enable Peterborough City Council to carry out initial transport studies in the Peterborough area and bring forward those that relieve congestion and enhance the economic uh, and housing growth ambition. In 2020-21, Peterborough City Council planned to undertake further initial transport studies. These studies will develop the early stages of feasibility to understand whether they are viable for further funding to progress to business case. This work is expected to enable Peterborough City Council to develop a pipeline of future schemes. Uh, the initial studies contribute, with the exception of the road safety review, to Peterborough City's growth agenda. The initial studies identified look to, uh, to mitigate future congestion areas and potentially improving journey time reliability and network resilience. 
a full list of the studies uh, to be undertaken in this current financial year is within the paper in the table. And I uh, commend this report to the board. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, members, any comments? No, so uh, I, I would need a seconder, please. Uh, I'm looking towards Councillor Holdick. Yeah, Herbert. second, Mr Mayor. Please, uh, uh, take your pick, Mr Parkin. Uh, and uh, again, as nobody has spoken uh, against, uh, I will assume that there is full support and move unanimously. Thank you very much. So item 3.4 is the Market Towns programme. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Domenico Carrillo, who is going to introduce the report for us. Domenico. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so this paper comes to you um, um, a little bit ahead of time. I was hoping to bring this paper to the July board, um, but we, in light of um, the current climate economically, um, we would like to mobilise with the delivery of the master plans programme. Um, the Market Towns um, programme was approved back in July 2018, just by way of some background. The combined authority has always been committed to the future prosperity and successes of our market towns and the impact that they can make um, economically at the local level. Um, it was also part of the Mayor's 100 Day Plan. And we have since um, commissioned and mobilised um, 11 um, master plans um, for key market towns around the um, Cambridgeshire and Heath Majority of those master plans have now been approved by the Combined Authority Board. We've had master plans for Fendon, Huntingtonshire, and East Cam's master plans are now being finalised and will be brought forward to the Combined Authority uh, Board in July for approval. In the meantime, we have prepared an investment perspective to mobilise delivery of these master plans and we'll be providing capital investment from the combined authority to act as a funding catalyst and to deliver against authorities identified within those plans. The total amount of funding that will be made available to these market towns will be 10 million of capital funding, 5 million of which was approved earlier today under item 2.1 that John Orslop presented. It also includes a further 3.1 million which is being recycled back into St Neots as a result of the um, proposed new footbridge no longer proceeding as planned. This means there is a total of 13.1 million capital investable um, to be uh, um, invested into the 11 towns as part of an investment prospectus. The purpose of this paper is to ask the board to, uh, to consider the scope of the investment perspective set out within this paper and the appraisal, apologies, and the application of the appraisal process therein outlined, and to ask if we could um, seek delegated authority to finalise this document to launch to the, to the, to the respective district um, authority leads. Uh, members are also asked to note that the Market Town Perspectives will be launched in June and that any funding applications Will be, subject to, uh, will be subject to approval by the Combined Authority Board and will be taken to July and September um, Combined Authority Board and onwards once they have been appraised internally. Um, and I think um, that's set out um, what we are condemning um, the paper for the, to, the, to the board, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I've got Councillor Smith who has put her hand up which surprises me that you were first as, sadly, none of these market towns are in, in your patch. No, I know, but I shop in, uh, well, I used to shop in St. Neots uh, regularly. And um, so they're very, you know, they may not be on my patch, but they're very important to me. Uh, so I just want to make the point that I think uh, COVID has shone a, shone a bright light on the value of people being able to shop locally, but also on the value of the, uh, the local microeconomies, uh, much of which is centered on, on market towns. And we've already heard about the importance of, uh, of Wizbeach. Uh, so some of my colleagues may well have been on the District Council Network call earlier today, where we had a presentation from Bill Grimsey, uh, who I'm sure you remember, there's been the Grimsey Report 1 and 2, uh, which is about you know, a complete new model for 21st century town, town centres. Uh, and what he said was he's about to publish um, a new report later this month on you know, a post-COVID 
Grimsey, Grimsey model for our town centre um, rege regeneration. So um, even though this, is, this paper is about giving money, I would hope that that was something that the combined authority would be cited on and would encourage um, applicants into this fund to uh, pay attention to because I, I mean I, I'm a huge fa fan of Bill Grimsey actually I think he's a true visionary and if we could be delivering some Grimsey type models within Cambridgeshire I think that would really um, you know really be a, mean, be, mean a huge lot to us particularly in our uh, strategic position on Oxcam actually. Okay. Thank you very much uh, Councillor Smith and thank you for that steer. Uh, Councillor Holditch. Yes, Mr. Mayor. I, I thought, and I, I, forgive me because I haven't got the papers in front of me because I got hacked yesterday and my computer's uh, not not working. But the, the way that was worded, that uh, if, if you if you like to put in a bid for a million, uh, you can have it. Uh, it's got to be against some sort of criteria, I would have thought, because you know if it's not against it, you probably only award half half of it. Uh, surely we've got to have some uh, uh, control over over what 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 is in it. I'll bring in Domenico on that because I'm sure there's a technical answer that uh, that I, I probably wouldn't be able to give you, but but I, I am in agreement. Uh, Councillor uh, Domenico, could you come in and answer Councillor Holditch's point, please? Yes, thank you, ma'am. Um, Councillor Holditch, you are right. So um, the paper does set out um, what the programme criteria will be and what we're asking um, proposals to 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 um, to address in terms of um, the, the funding call. Um, so that's all set out in the paper. I will, I will also address um, Councillor Bridget's point around um, responding to COVID. I think we are, we, we, we're going to be setting out how market, we want to, um, we want proposals to set out how market towns can address um, COVID recovery, looking at new ways of, of using public transport, new ways of behaviour around increased working from home and maybe um, um, remote working, the use of public space and um, commercial space on the high street. Um, and, not, and um, transport connectivity, footpaths, and digital connectivity as well. So we are looking at those things um, uh, as part of this funding call. Okay, thank you, Domenico. Uh, does that satisfy you, Councillor Holditch? And have the uh, district councils been consulted on what ought to go into these bids? Uh, Domenico. But yes, Councillor Holditch, I'm in discussions with the local authorities um, in shaping this. Um, as I said earlier, we're asking for delegation to finalise this document with, with, with those partners um, and, and officers internally at Combined Authority. Um, and um, so, yes. Yeah, I mean, this has always been a bottom up scheme rather than top down, I feel. Um, thank you. Councillor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Count. Uh, thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, there's, there's one specific point I want to raise, and it's about this uh, £10 million across the 10 market towns, bids of uh, up to £1 million each. It's contained in uh, Investment Prospectus 3.3 on page 125. And I think there's some wording difficulty there causing some misunderstandings, and it'd be useful, whether it's today or at a later date, that's cleared up. Because it, the way it reads is if there's 10 million pounds, 10 towns, and you're allowed to bid up to 1 million pound each, it's, it's, it's automatic. You either get 1 million pounds or the pot will be underspent as nobody can bid for over 1 million pound. But I, I know that's not the intention, so I will leave that as a, to be clarified uh, as we move, move along. Because it is important that this money is spent and it's spent in the near future because it will be, you know, we're talking about coronavirus earlier. Um, I think that the um, the smaller projects that market towns and their district uh, colleagues are able to deliver will be much faster than the much larger projects that we all hang our hook on. And it brings me back to an earlier point I made uh, during the budget paper, that if there was underspends, that, that really there should be some board involvement about reallocation of those, because this um, this area, I I do think that this is an area that we could spend money in quickly um, that will actually have good BCRs and good delivery on the ground compared to some schemes. Having said that, um, I, live, I live in March and we're well advanced in our plans and we were very fortunate we had our uh, area transport strategy at the same time as this and our high street funding bid and we're having very positive talks with government about the high street funding bid and it's probably on the back of the market town plan 
that we are able to develop that to fully. So a lot of the money, I totally agree with the mayor, will be coming from government as they see these good plans and they lobby for money and there'll be monies made available for them. But in some cases, they may be looking for matched funding. And I do wonder, you know, if you look at the, the growth of the combined authority area and the economic growth that's now project, projected nationally to come from smaller conurbations from towns, primarily due to coronavirus, whether we need to refocus some of our priorities in that way. And I think that's a discussion we need to have. It's pointless having it now, because the point about now is there are very few of these finalised. Right? We need them all on our desk at the same time. Anything that hasn't been funded from the 10 million pot that's very generously been allocated, we need then a scheme of how to move them forward, which ones to move forward and which ones to move forward rapidly. And that may involve direct funding of some of them. We don't know at this stage until we see them all and match them up against each other. So just putting a marker down, James, uh, sorry, Mayor, um, uh, excellent work here, really glad about the extra m money. And I think that uh, once we get all the plans in, let's sit down and see what we can accelerate that's on the remaining plans. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, clearly this has doubled the fund. That, that, that's the reality. We, we're doubling the fund for these market towns. Uh, more people live in our market towns and live in either Cambridge or, or Peterborough. And, uh, and of course, we know we get told a lot about the left behind towns of the north. Uh, uh, but we know there's also left behind towns in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough as well. The significant investment that we've put into St. Neots is because it has been uh, very much been left behind over the years. And, and we've seen today uh, commitment to the Fens through Wisbeach Rail Project and obviously through our market towns in this, this, uh, in this scheme. Certainly, you know, we, 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 are, we are acting now in the very short term. So there is money uh, this summer to invest into our towns. And that's absolutely clear that it will be available and directly available. And we've been able to take as an example uh, the work that, that we've done through the business board on the capital grant scheme, where, where, where businesses have been able to get easy access to money uh, and directly invest that money into their businesses to, uh, to not only um, uh, make sure that 500 people stayed in work, but to create another 270 jobs on top of that. And there's small businesses in every single one of these market towns that would benefit from even grants of two, three thousand pounds. And that can't, let's not underestimate the difference that would make, particularly at this time. But I am in agreement with Councillor Count. There's no reason why we can't re relook at our budget again and again and again. And if there are ways that we can bring forward money from schemes that are dormant, as we've already done, uh, then we should do so. But it is a balance of short-term and long-term investment. Uh, I've got Councillor Holditch. Sorry, I don't think you have. I have not got it. Right. And it gone uh, there. Then, Councillor Bailey has been very patient. Councillor Bailey. Thank you very much. Yeah, I really just wanted to um, thoroughly support what Councillor Count was saying. And I think, um, you know, this is a recognition of the value that uh, you can place on having plans and schemes worked up and ready to go so that, you know, we've got a proper plan, it's coherent, we, we're picking bits off as and, as and when funding comes forward. And uh, it's very welcome, this additional, additional funding. Um, obviously, um, two of our plans haven't yet come forward, but they are on the board agenda for July uh, for um, uh, so and Ely, uh, we've already done uh, the first piece of work for our Little Port one. So yeah, just really want to support this and, and um, uh, echo what Councillor Count has said about, you know, if there isn't enough money in this first uh, phase, then we do need to um, look at funding this uh, forward, in, you know, and, and committing to these plans very long term because investment at this level makes a massive, massive difference to the people that live locally. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Uh, there are no other members indicating to speak. Uh, so uh, again, I would uh, uh, recommend uh, from the chair and do I have a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor Count Austin Adams. Again, I'll let Robert Parkin make his choice. Um, and uh, again, nobody has spoken against this. Uh, so I will assume unless somebody waves at me frantically that you are all in favour. Uh, so we will put that through as a unanimous vote. And uh, thank you very much, members. Um, as previously advertised, uh, we are going to the item 3.5, which is the Combined Authority Retraining Scheme pilot. Uh, and Fiona McGonagall is going to introduce. Fiona. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor Palmer, and um, good afternoon, members. Um, the combined authority paper is um, on the uh, bringing forward the national retraining scheme. Um, we've been asked as officers by ministers in the Department for Education to be a pilot area for a retraining scheme. Cambridge and Peterborough has been seen to be that area. Um, and the request from the, the board would be to um, give us um, permission to launch and develop uh, and to spend the uh, allocated 80,100 from the Department for Education. Thank you very much, Fiona. Uh, members. Uh, Councillor Holditch. Yeah, I think this is quite important. It, it isn't a huge sum of money, but we need to uh, look at uh, job situation and retraining, uh, certainly after the, the virus is over, because we don't know who's going to lose their jobs and who will want to, to be retrained. So I think it's an important piece of work that uh, needs to be done, that we're ready to go. Uh, any other comments from members at all? Well, I, I absolutely agree with Councillor Holditch and some of the best work we've done as a combined authority has been uh, investing in training and investing into uh, uh, adult education. Uh, as Councillor Holditch says, this is, this is extraordinarily important at the moment. We don't yet know the effect, but we need to be prepared to help as many people as possible. And, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Ms McGonagall on her work in this area. Uh, so again, I'm moving from the chair and, and Councillor Holditch will second. Um, will. Uh, and there are no speakers against, so I would suggest that uh, this excellent piece of work will be uh, unanimously supported. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, item 3.6 is the surrender of the lease at, uh, at Oakenbury. Um, this report was added to the forward plan as a key decision on the 26th of May 2020 under the general exception arrangements set out in the constitution. Uh, and we have a question on this from Overview Scrutiny Com Committee uh, and Councillor Kevin Price. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, so the question from the Overview and Scrutiny Committee is uh, that the paper accompanying this item refers to savings that will be achieved as a result of the surrender of the lease of the combined authority headquarters in Alconbury. However, there are no assumptions included in terms of the costs associated with alternative accommodation. Can the board provide a more accurate savings figure which takes into account such costs? Secondly, why is the combined authority paying a whole year's rental costs to terminate the lease at Alconbury? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Councillor Price. So the combined authority is looking to pay the 151,000 £537.50 pence settlement figure because it represents a substantial saving over the total accommodation liability that would be incurred during the year, the three-year period until the next break option date in the existing lease. That's July 2023. The settlement figure represents less than six months of the total annual accommodation cost, which is £307,651. So we're actually paying less than six months, not an entire year. Uh, the current situation is evolving, and aside from temporary space, freehold options will be considered when accommodate, which, which would accommodate a mix of work practices and locations. These will be consulted with staff, and assessment of space requirements and costs will follow as part of any future proposal to the board. A more accurate savings figure will be provided to the board when these options and costs are better known. Uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce uh, John Hill to bring forward the report. John yes, thank Hill. you, Mr. Mayor. This item relates to and uh, forms part of the proposals for new office accommodation for the CPCA. It's a three stage process. This is the first stage, which is the surrender of the lease. And the financial case for that is set out in paragraph three and confirmed by your answer to the questions um, from overview and scrutiny. Can I also take the opportunity very briefly, Mr. Mayor, to update everyone on um, the overall project? The second Please. stage after the surrender of the lease relates to temporary accommodation. And we'll be proposing a series of hubs across the CA area, preferably in existing local authority premises. And we are starting to make progress with that. Um, the temporary locations selected will be driven by staff preference which, um, which will be through our newly established 
staff consultative forum, which you uh, referred to in your previous answer. And obviously value for money. And I, I do reflect on Councillor Bowden's point at an informal meeting that we need to make those cost comparisons simple, transparent and consistent. And I think he proposed a pound per square metre measure, which seems to me um, very sensible. We do hope to settle on these temporary locations as soon as possible. And then um, I do ask, uh, ask leaders to thank your officers for the um, cooperation that you've given us at this time, when they've got lots of other things to be going on with as well. Um, when we have these in place, the third phase will be very much the permanent accommodation. And I do counsel the board to allow us to reflect and take time with the new staff forum to review our opportunities around home and agile working. And for that matter, revise our final specification. Because I feel if we take time at that stage, it will be worthwhile and provide a unique opportunity to, avoid, uh, to, um, to identify a specification for the new build, which is fit for purpose and for the new world we all will live in. Um, I've got to reiterate in terms of permanent accommodation, um, we, are, we remain very open about the location of that permanent accommodation. The shortlist on locations, which will be agreed by this board, um, but also informed by staff consultation, will be based on accessibility and connectivity of public transport. Following the board's approval of the shortlist of locations, we will do a market assessment of the availability, availability cost of specific available premises in those areas. The final decision on the location of the new offices will be a matter for the decision of this board. The, rec the recommendations, Mr. Mayor, are detailed in the report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, we have uh, Councillor Bowden, who's indicated to speak. Councillor Bowden. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Hill, for that uh, uh, report. You know, I actually quite like our offices in Alcantara. I enjoy going there, and I look forward to the time when the County Council moves to Alcantara, and I'm sure I'll enjoy going to Alcantara then far more than I currently enjoy going to Shire Hall. But uh, what's key here is the fact that the combined authority is quite constrained on the revenue side. There's a large amount of capital which is available to us to spend, but the revenue side is more constrained. So it is, uh, it is quite appropriate uh, that the that action is being taken now to ensure that we utilize our scarce revenue resources more effectively. And for that reason, despite the fact that I like the Alcantara uh, um, uh, officers, that it's for that reason that I very much welcome what is being proposed here. And we've acted extremely quickly uh, when faced with, a, with a, a rather unexpected opportunity. And I congratulate the officers for being able to do so. I welcome the fact that in this report, recommendation C and paragraph 2.12 make it clear that the uh, consideration of permanent accommodation will be coming back to this board for decision. And that's entirely appropriate with all the necessary information. I was a little bit disappointed that on paragraph 2.15, the same isn't said for the temporary uh, accommodation which is going to be decided upon. And it looks as though those decisions are going to be made without reference to this board and I would have thought that as a matter of courtesy, it probably should be referred to this board or at least to the leaders uh, informally outside the board so that input could be given by us about the temporary arrangements which will be in place. But apart from that, I'm extremely happy with this report. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bowden. Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, thank you, John Hill. Um, so I welcome the, the temporary solution of um, a hub, a hub approach. I think that's a good idea. But actually, might this hub model be considered as a permanent solution? Will, you know, once we've been in temporary accommodation for a while, we'll obviously know how much that costs. We'll know, uh, our officers will be able to tell us, you know, what it feels like, how good it is for them, you know, whether actually working within other organisations is beneficial. And will we, will we cost that against a per single permanent um, accommodation? but also taking into account what our officer's views are. I think quite clearly, I can bring in Mr Hill, but I think quite clearly, yes, Councillor uh, Smith, I, I would say so. Uh, Mr Hill, do you want to comment on, um, on Ms Councillor Smith's uh, point? 
yeah, I, I reiterate your answer, Mr. Mayor. I think it's a very sensible solution. And if the, the board will allow me to expand my definition of open mind to allow me to um, assess the uh, hub approach alongside uh, other locations for a, a permanent home, I'll do that with great pleasure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hill. Uh, Councillor Herbert, you, you had got your hand up to talk and you've disappeared. Can I assume you still want to? Briefly, it, um, yeah, I don't have any problem with the recommendation, but, but I think it's, if you take the example of someone moving home, normally you work out where you're going to move to before you sell the old one. So I, I just think that we do need to have a report about what, what uh, arrangements there will be. Um, clearly, Alconbury was um, gold plate and we don't need it um, but we do need to um, have a base and it needs to be accessible both for particularly for our staff um, because it, while some may prefer at the moment working in isolation we will need to get together and I think we have to find a route both as councils and as a combined authority that both is leaner and more efficient but also still brings teams together um, I think you get you get a certain exchange uh, through routes like this medium, but bringing people together is the best way of um, both the staff and um, councillors in the future, um, uh, because we'll still need to get the energy that I do think that teams get from meeting up um, fairly frequently. I agree, uh, Councillor uh, Herbert, and of course, where we are very fortunate is there are seven authorities in this uh, combined authority and each one has meeting rooms and chambers that, that we, we regularly use and uh, I personally cannot wait until we're back in that situation. Uh, Austin Adams. Yeah thank you. I, I, I certainly support this. I mean in terms of um, just the financial uh, position that makes perfect sense and in light of um, the world at which, which, which we're, we're uh, we're working within at the moment clearly there will be changes to people's working practices and the need for a, a large central facility is, uh, is likely to diminish. Um, I, I would say the 151,000 costs to get out of this lease looks like a great deal. Um, officers have clearly worked very very well to negotiate that position. Um, just, just one technical point on that I'm assuming that includes all the depreciation the uh, dilapidation costs as well or obligations that might sit behind this lease albeit it's a relatively new building um, it's typical to have a pretty hefty dilapidation obligation to exit a lease so working assumption is unless someone tells us otherwise that that's in that number and that is the cost to exit the facility can I can I ask you mr. Hill to comment on that technical detail Um, I, I personally can't confirm whether that's the case and obviously it is a very new building. I don't know whether colleagues in finance or um, legal may wish to comment, but if not, um, we will obviously get back to um, the board on that matter. But I suspect that will be um, a small amount if it is not included in that. Yeah, if I can assist Mr Mayor, I think that is the inclusive sum for, for the purposes of the landlord um, breakage. Um, yeah, if, if 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 we're not correcting that, we'll and that we'll no doubt revert it. Yeah, okay. thank you, Mr. Parkin. Um, does that answer your question, uh, Mr. Adams? Indeed, thank you, James. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Count. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, there, there's some points in there: three, 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 four, three, five uh, that fail to Im uh, indicate the new. Accommodation costs, costs of music, costs of mo moving, etc. So they don't fully explain the picture. So I can understand the questions that were raised by the overview and scrutiny because it gave pretty much one side of the picture without filling in the other side. Uh, and perhaps it, it should have been written in a slightly toned down manner about the amount of savings to be realised because they won't be fully fully realised. There will be moving costs. There will be um, uh, costs. Um, associated with the new building, uh, which will be more accurate. So I understand their questions. Um, we've already, or I've already had that informal uh, information stating that the new costs of new potential sites are substantially cheaper. So um, whilst I recognise that the full savings won't, won't be met, um, I do believe that there are 
substantial savings to, to be recovered. So I'm quite happy with uh, going along with this paper. It's not a leap of faith, it's based on what I've been informed and I expect that to be fully realized. I do think that a core piece of work in, in moving to a future office space needs to revolve not around the um, not around the cost, not around the what the staff think, but actually our requirements. This this um, element of the new world and the new way that we operate with so much re remote working, and with so many councils with a available space in their building and other buildings, how much of it do we need as permanent space for ourselves? And how much do we need as flexible thing? It's because I don't think you can boil down to the costs until you've really flushed that piece of work out. Now I know it's included. I just wanted to put down a marker that I think I think that's a, a vital element. Um, when it does come to uh, after you've established your need for the uh, uh, for accommodation space, I would say that uh, I, I do want to put down a marker that the costs are, are to be you know significantly scored whilst we uh, appreciate the wishes and the desires of the present staff what we have to realize is they they do fluctuate over time uh, and this is to be a new permanent arrangement and I don't want in two or three years time to be looking at a new decision uh, because something else has come along uh, I expect this uh, after going from temporary to a permanent it to be a more permanent arrangement and therefore the costs for me are, are, are the primary driver, the size and the cost of the primary driver. Happy to support the paper that's in front of us today and look forward to seeing the rest of the work coming forward to the board for our consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, nobody else has indicated to speak. I will say I think there's been more nonsense written about this uh, in the press than pretty much anything that uh, I can remember for the last year or so. The reality is this is a financial decision uh, the action came because of opportunity. Uh, uh, and Councillor uh, Herbert mentioned, you know, you don't often sell a house before buying another one, but it depends what the deal is. And uh, I think that Mr. Adams hit the nail on the head. This is a cracking deal for the combined authority. And let's not remember when the lease was taken on Alconbury, we had a much larger staff, including the LEP staff, of course, as well. And uh, all of us who, who go to Alconbury realise that half of the building is not in use at any time and uh, therefore, is it the best use of finance and the best use of space uh, for the area? And I, I will also repeat that the quotes that have been uh, uh, suggested, what I've said about uh, Alconbury, have been completely taken uh, out of consequence context. And the things that I've never said have been put as fact in the press, uh, which again is a complete and utter nonsense. So this is purely a financial decision uh, for the reason that Councillor Bowden mentioned. This is about revenue, it's about finance. And it's also about making sure that we have the best solution for our staff. And, uh, and ultimately, uh, we will come back to this board. And I'm convinced there will be savings because the first thing is we will not be paying for double the space we need. Um, that's the first thing. But equally, uh, I don't think now is the time for a knee-jerk uh, reaction and commit ourselves to a, a shiny new building in the next three, four months. I think the right time, uh, this has come at exactly the right time with the information that we've gleaned from COVID-19 and work, working from home, uh, I think that we can promote best practice from the combined authority in a new way. So uh, it's exciting opportunity and, uh, and I'm delighted that it's happening at this time. Um, so again, I, I'm prepared to uh, chair, uh, promote from the chair. Do I have a seconder? I'll second. Uh, Councillor Holditch, uh, all those in favour? Uh, Again, nobody spoke again, so I will suggest everybody's in favour unless somebody wildly nods. So, uh, again, unanimous. So, thank you very much. We move on to uh, uh, part four, which is the Local Highways Maintenance Capital Grant Allocation 2020 21. Um, and uh, John Olsop is going to introduce the report. John. John, I'm afraid you're muted. We've all been there. Yeah, apologies for that. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so this paper sets out the allocation of the Local Highways Maintenance Capital Grant for 2020-21. 
um, which has been received by the combined authority um, and it is to be allocated between the two highways agencies, the County Council and Peterborough City Council, in accordance with the formula as set out by um, uh, the DFT. Um, there is a requirement in the constitution that the mayor must consult the combined authority before making a mayoral decision to allocate this, uh, this funding. Um, and that's the purpose of this paper. Um, the recommended allocation is set out um, under uh, 1.2b with a further uh, breakdown of the figures between integrated transport block maintenance needs element and the incentive block as set out in paragraph 2.5. Um, there is a, a condition um, of the funding allocation to the highways authorities um, and that's for each of them to provide assurances to the combined authority to enable the chief executive and chief interim auditor to sign and return a declaration to uh, the Department for Transport to confirm that the conditions of the funding have been complied with. Um, uh, happy to take any questions. Any comments, members? No. So, uh, as uh, uh, this is a mayoral decision uh, and in consultation with the board, having consulted the board and there are no comments, my decision is to approve the recommendations. Uh, oh, we, no. move on, uh, we move on to the business board uh, recommendations, uh, item 5.1. And the report contains two appendices which are exempt from publication under paragraph three of part one of schedule 12a of the local government act 1972 as amended in that it would not be in the public interest for this information to be disclosed information relating to the financial or business affairs of any particular person including the authority holding that information if any members of the board wish to discuss the information contained in those appendices we will need to consider whether to go into private session does any member want to uh, discuss the exempt appendices? No, so then we will go to uh, uh, Steve Clark, who's the Strategic Funds Manager, who's going to briefly introduce the report, Steve. Yeah, you're muted, unfortunately, still, Steve. Oh, there we go, uh, we all do it. Um, so, yes, uh, uh, hi, um, so uh, this is to, Sorry about the background noise, uh, child moving equipment. Okay, just go. <laughs> um, so this is uh, to provide the board with an operational update on the local growth fund uh, as at 1st of May. Um, uh, so uh, key points, uh, uh, it's a rather long update paper. So I'll, I'll go through just the key points uh, here. So our uh, 2021 annual grant payment, uh, the 35 million we were expecting from cities and local growth unit uh, this year, they have decided to uh, split two thirds, they're paying two thirds now and holding one third back, subject to review of all of our projects being uh, under contract and, in and, and likely to be in delivery uh, before March 21 and payment defrayed. Um, so uh, as officers, obviously we are working hard with all of our current projects that are not under contract uh, to get to that point, uh, to make sure uh, that last third of funding is not withheld or any, any amount of it. Um, we're quite confident that um, we can get to that position. Um, in terms of financial uh, spend on the programme, uh, whilst we sit at 79 0.56 million gone out of the uh, the fund uh, actual paid so far. Our actual uh, current rolling uh, allocation of approved is, is still uh, up at 139 uh, million. The, um, the quarter four uh, return to uh, MHCLG, uh, that, that department have requested uh, they, that they don't need it for another two months. Uh, they've given us two months grace because of COVID. Uh, we're still working on providing that, that return and it will come back as a, an attachment to the paper uh, next board round. Um, in terms of pipeline of projects that are still currently in delivery, we've got 14 that are live, uh, 16 in pre-contract uh, that were approved. Uh, many of those have been slow to sign um, because of obviously COVID and, and, and concerns, but 
but many of those are returning now. Um, and since this report was written, we, we have um, uh, several that are uh, actually coming to our uh, monitoring team for final. Um, and then we have 18 completed projects uh, as part of the program. The, um, an update on the COVID capital grant scheme. Um, uh, in the report, uh, it, it's the 1st of May figures, but actually as of today, that scheme launched on the 7th of April um, and unprecedented demand. Uh, and um, we have had 127 uh, applications approved uh, uh, for grants and uh, 785 projected forecast jobs split between 508 protected, 277 new. And the amount of grant currently awarded today is just shy of 5.3 million. And we have uh, just over 200,000 left to commit, which is uh, working through on the last six projects uh, as we speak today. So uh, that scheme is now closed in, in, a, in a sense uh, for what it was meant to do. Um, the Agritech uh, grant scheme carries on. Um, there's currently five applications with the board, two new inquiries in April, and we've had a further three during May, which isn't in the report, um, and nine live projects that were already in delivery. Um, the, um, uh, we have uh, within this paper a uh, proposal for reallocating 320,000 of local growth fund uh, that was returned to us from West Anglia training uh, into to combine it with the uh, Adult Education Budget Innovation Fund that was approved at the last uh, board. Um, so we propose that 320K be matched to the AEB 350,000 fund. Um, this will create an enhanced mix of capital and revenue to that fund to support skills providers, FE colleges, um, bring forward uh, adaptations um, in their terms of their delivery and outreach to students who are currently not able to continue with their training uh, and apprenticeships. And um, this would mean there's no match funding requirement by putting the two funds together from those providers. Um, the scheme criteria is at Appendix D with the paper in terms of how that will operate uh, managed by AEB officers. Um, and then um, uh, the, uh, I've included um, uh, an assessment at Appendix E of the current remaining pipeline of LGF projects. These are all at different stages in the system. Um, and the amount of funds um, that's either returning to us if any of our projects, um, uh, and we have had one during my College of West Anglia, have actually formally withdrawn from the programme. Um, we will be looking to reallocate that money with this pipeline of projects. And um, I set out in Appendix E the sort of timeline we think that these projects will be ready for approval at boards um, with that returned funding. And finally, monitoring and evaluation. The monitoring continues um, as is monthly, quarterly. The, um, the evaluation plan that we brought to board in January, we've not yet been able to enact as officers have been uh, busy with the COVID grant schemes and response programs, but we do plan to um, bring forward that evaluation work now combined with another piece of work that the Business and Skills Director are procuring around uh, insight, data analysis and economic impact due to COVID. We will also have uh, LGF historic and future evaluation built into that. Um, that's it in terms of a quick summary. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, members, do you have any comments? Uh, Austin. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I think firstly, um, I'd like to compliment all the officers uh, working hard behind the scenes, Steve and the rest of the team, um, on, a, on a number of fronts. One, I think it, it's worthy of note that the, um, the, capital, the, the COVID capital grant scheme uh, has, has been hugely successful, as we've heard from Steve. That's also been recognised nationally by ministers as being a very good example of being innovative, moving quickly and having direct and immediate impact in the right places. 
and John John T Hill, who sent his apologies to this meeting today, um, he's currently working on a paper to put to government to to better explain that and articulate some of the benefits that uh, that, that has delivered, with a view to that being looked at um, in other areas across the UK. So I think um, certainly praise is due there. The the, the team working in and amongst this have got a considerable challenge here, not least of which we had a challenge before COVID came along to make sure that we appropriately deployed all the LGF funding and in a manner that it could be burnt off before May next year. Um, the impact of COVID in and amongst has, has severely impacted that across a range of projects and People are working very, very hard to make sure that we're in a position to provide certainty around the projects that we're backing. And the ones that have less certainty, we have a contingency plan to backfill all of that allocated funding to get to a position where we do not end up having to give any of this funding back. And, and, and that's a huge piece of work that's going on behind the scenes with the... Uh, with the officers to get that done in and amongst dealing with the COVID situation as well. So um, I'm in awe of them, frankly, of their, their determination, effort and commitment to, to continue fighting on all these fronts. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Adams. Uh, Councillor Count. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Very much echo what uh, Austin had to say. Great projects coming forward, making an immediate difference on the ground. Uh, very, one very simple question. You're going to bring forward some work on evaluation and monitoring of the programme. I just wanted to know that covers such elements as, as identifying that the money that we allocate gets spent on what we believed it would be spent on, and also that it develops the jobs that we were told it would develop. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, just coming back on that. Uh, yeah, the evaluation plan that we drew up in January that came to the board does indeed cover all of those indicators. Um, and it will start with all the historic projects that have, that have been delivered thus today. And then, of course, we'll look at all these uh, current ones uh, next year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I have uh, uh, nobody else has uh, indicated to speak. So, uh, Mr. Adams, do you have a seconder? Somebody could indicate a second. Chris Bowden, yeah. Councillor Bowden has, uh, has, has come forward. So uh, uh, again, nobody's spoken in uh, opposition to the outstanding work that the, the Business Board has been doing. And can I just add uh, to what's been said, my personal congratulations and thanks to the team for their incredible work over the last 13 weeks. And uh, there are people who are still in business because of this team. Uh, and there are people who are still in work because of this team. And, and uh, on behalf of those people, I would like to thank you. Um, so can, can we add to your comments the, the chair as well because the chair has been uh, very very good in this and, con and controlling it and look after, looking after it. Yeah absolutely apologies Austin I was remiss of me not to bring you in initially. Um, so uh, again assuming everybody's in favour unless they wildly wave uh, that's a unanimous uh, decision. Uh, so item 5.2 is the business board constitution review and this report was also considered by the business board on the 26th of may 2020 austin adams chair of the business board would you like to comment or are you happy for officers to introduce the report uh, i'd like to welcome uh, rochelle white to introduce the report please um, there. thank you mr adams uh, rochelle good afternoon mr mayor good afternoon members of the combined authority uh, the uh, recommendation before you today is to approve the amendment to the constitution set out in Appendix 1. Uh, to give some background, in September 2018, the first version of the Business Board Constitution was approved. It was subsequently revised in May of 2019. Uh, members will be aware of the governance review, which took place in March of this year, and a number of the recommendations flowing from that review now implemented in the revision to the constitution. I refer you to appendix one and I'm happy to take any comments or questions on the track change version. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Rochelle. Uh, Councillor Count has first with his hand up. Uh, thank you Mayor. Um, I've got two questions, they're quite minor. Uh, one's 
more more about detail in the other one's actual question at um let me identify this page 169 13a uh, women make up one at least one third of the board by 2020 um is is uh, reversed out by the point at 8.5 where the 2020 is taken out so for me that's a tidying up exercise um it seems to me that we we know we aren't there yet we need to get there so we wish to get to a, a third of the board so 13a is is incorrect but it would be useful there was a target before if um if we're serious about this we need a new target and not just that women make up at least one third of the board in which case we're not there um and the, the other one which is a, a more of a question for me um 1.1.2 delegate authority to the director of business and skills in conjunction with and it says to approve small grants to smes uh, previously there was some definition of what that meant in terms of money and at this present point in time on the track changes i cannot see there or anywhere else what small grants means and and for me that that leaves it a bit open-ended that could mean different things to different people so some clarity or some additional words suggested please uh, Rochelle thank you Mr Mayor so back in November of 2019 the combined authority board changed the delegation to uh, uh, applicable to the director of uh, business and skills and what what we've done is we've reflected the wording of that approval the report that accompanied that recommendation in uh, November uh, detailed the maximum limit of 150k. So I'm happy to put that in, but it's purely because it wasn't approved with the figure um, back in November why it was taken out. But if, if members are happy for the figure maximum limit to be put back in, I'm happy to put that in there. If I may, Mayor, it, there seems to be a 150k figure in there, which is unlined and struck through, but I, I'm happy for, for that to be the figure and reintroduced. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, and uh, your other point, uh, Councillor Count, uh, Rochelle, could you come back on the, uh, uh, on the amount of women on the board, please? Yeah, so uh, we've met how our target for diversity at the moment. So we removed the figure, sorry, removed the date purely because we had met, we've, we've achieved what we expected to achieve. Um, that's the only reason for removal. I didn't quite get the second reference to 13.1. If uh, Councillor Count could direct me to the page number, that would be very helpful. So that's, uh, that's page 169. It's 13A and it still has the 2020 on there. Okay, so you're, is, that's the, the wider constitutional document tying them together. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. We can tie the figures together with the wider constitutional and I believe that's coming back in July where we'll do the full review of the constitution. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Herbert. Um, Excuse me, uh, can I just come next? I've got to answer the door. Sorry, I'll be yes, back. Yes, of course. Yeah, go, go, and, go and get your Amazon parcel and Councillor Smith is poised to come in. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, I'd appreciate being able to direct my uh, questions to the chair, if I may. Of course. Um, so thank you. So, um, so I had noted the, uh, the point about the lack of clarity over the delegation to SMEs that Councillor Count has picked up, so I won't reiterate on that. Um, on 9.4, on a page 156, there's a deletion that greatly concerns me. We've deleted that business board members should not have made substantial personal contributions to any political party and must not have served as an officer in any political party which actually means that under the new constitution, a business board member can do both. I think this is a very unusual deletion for a business board, so I'd appreciate understanding um, from Mr Adams uh, that. Um, picking up on Councillor Count's issue about 8.5 and the, us having reached our target of a third woman, I'm, really, I'm very pleased that you've, you know, you've done well in a reasonably short period of time to recruit more women to the board. But my understanding is that Bay's requirement uh, is for that to be 50%. And you know, surely we're going to be held to account for that. 
Um, I think I'm going to be straying into governance territory here. But, you know, one way of doing that would be to improve the democratic representation of our business board, to bring it far more in line with our neighbouring LEPs. Uh, so currently we have the mayor and the mayor's deputy, who's appointed by the mayor as the only uh, elected members. SEMLEP have, out of 21 members, eight elected members. New Anglia have six out of 18, Hertfordshire have four out of 15, London have six out of 17, and Oxlep have six out of 20. You know, we don't compare favourably, and I think this is going to become uh, increasingly more difficult to justify as the government starts looking uh, more closely at the, the LEPs, and at the end of the day, we are the equivalent of a LEP. Um, we also haven't addressed the issue of coterminosity, which I, I assumed we, we did ages ago, but we don't seem to have done that. Um, and, you know, it's frustrating to me as a leader of, uh, you know, one of the, you know, an important part, as is everybody, of, uh, of the catchment area that I'm, I can't even, I don't think I can even attend informally to observe these meetings. So, you know, there's a, there's a lack of, um, there's a lack of transparency to me there which could be addressed by, you know, really bringing us in line with the other, the other LEPs. Um, but I'd appreciate comment on why we have remo removed that uh, requirement, because I went through our website and I checked out um, everybody's uh, declaration of interest yesterday. You know, it doesn't seem to be a problem. So why, why take out something that, again, puts us in line with other LEPs? Thank you. Mr. Adams. All right, let me try and deal with some of those. So, I mean, drawing comparisons with other LEPs in the UK, I think we, we have to come back to an understanding of the model that we have here, where the combined authority or the accountable body for the decisions that are presented to them for the support um, in this meeting. This meeting has a plethora of political representation. And in that respect, our resolve is to make sure that the business board is front and centre making recommendations that are based on solid business decisions, uninfluenced by politics. And forever I'm the chair, that's the way I'm going to drive it. We have the opportunity, as we've just debated with some of the issues, to bring the opportunities and the decisions to this meeting for that to be brought to be held accountable and for you guys to vote and make decisions on the recommendations that are delivered. I believe that is a far more um, democratic and healthy uh, arrangement than the other LEPs enjoy around the UK. It's a different model. And in that respect, what we ask of and what the requirements of the business board and its constitution supports are aligned to that objective. Yes, uh, Councillor Smith. Uh, are you, unfortunately, you're muted. Sorry, Bridget, we can't hear you. Sorry, thank you very much. Uh, so, Mr Adams, if you say that on your watch, the business of the board will be uninfluenced by politics. Surely you would keep in that no member of the board should have made either substantial personal contributions to a political party or have served as an officer of a political party. Because if you're opening, opening up board membership to people who might well have served in both, you know, made significant financial contributions and served for a political party, then you are not being uninfluenced by politics. I was, you know, I, I can't support it in the, in the state it's in at the moment. You know, you, you're mean? contradicting yourself, I'm afraid. I, I don't think so. Mr. Mayor, can, can, can I come back yeah, on uh, that? Rochelle. Um, so sorry. Um, so if you look at 9.3 above, it still remains. It's point I. So it's just uh, uh, the way it's been redrafted. So private sector board members must not, I, be an active member of, of Parliament, ETC. So it's still there. Okay, okay. okay. all right, sorry, I missed that. Okay. Uh, yeah, my, okay. my apologies, my apologies to, uh, to both of you. Okay, uh, Councillor Camp, was that what you were going to come in on that particular point? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Herbert. Thank you. No, I, I've had a problem with uh, 
a, a, a toilet uh, in and I finally got somebody to visit. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so so I'm, I'm Councillor Smith raised this issue of luminosity and apologies if I didn't uh, uh, I wasn't fully uh, listening at the time, but but we we still have um, in 2.2 this definition, which includes seven districts outside uh, the boundaries of the combined authority and six within. I I, I would though in prefacing a couple of remarks here, just uh, want to compliment the business board. Um, for what it's done and also particularly the support of the officer team in there. But so I'm, I'm, I'm still unclear, particularly because Bayes made it quite clear in their review last year, Mayor, um, that they expected coterminosity to be applied, um, as well as um, underlining the point that has been discussed that they expected um, us to achieve much quicker than 2023 um, equity between men and women on, on the board. The other bit that um, uh, concerns me is just the, the greater um, sort of sort of the, the, the lesser transparency, I believe, in some of the ways that vacancies will be filled. Sometimes on any board you get two or three vacancies at the same time and I don't really think that the board should be in control wholly of, of filling those from a reserve list. Um, uh, like Councillor Smith, um, I, I did dig out the membership of the board, the business board, and, and anybody can do that. And so it is there, but it, it hasn't really been uh, significantly promoted and publicized. And I would hope that, uh, that the board would support a more transparent proposals and have a look at that to attract more potential um, people, including women, but, but of all types. Um, clearly, there are representatives on the board for each of the different sectors, but at the same time, there's always room to strengthen that, um, including a real small, um, a couple of real small or medium-sized enterprise representatives, and I think also links to the business networks that we've got. So, I, I, I would really like to see the board think about ways that it could network out, um, be more visible, um, including because it's been doing really good work. But I also would like to see confirmation that coterminosity and that the strength of the focus on things like the Spear Report and our economy and on the economic recovery that we will all be working so hard to support is there on the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough geography. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Councillor Herbert. Um, Austin, do you want to come back on that? Uh, Rochelle, Rochelle has raised her hand as well. If you want to bring in yeah. Rochelle at the appropriate time. If I may. So, I mean, there are a number of different points there. I think we, we, we have done very well to get to a position in fairly short order from where we were to get 36% of the board um, in, a, in a balance of female members. There's clearly more that we can do there, but... Um, what I can say to you, having spoken to, uh, to chairs of a number of other LEPs around the UK, that we're doing better than most, frankly, uh, in that respect. And, and yes, it is a challenge, and, and I, I don't doubt that we will continue to address that and very successfully as time goes by. Um, in terms of the blend of people on the board, again, that's something we were very cognizant of, and it's a matter that's been discussed at this board previously. I note that in terms of representing small to medium businesses, we've got one, two, three, four, and myself, five people. Again, 36% of the constitution of the board represent SMEs, and are running SMEs and are involved in them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we've tried to get a good sectorial representation across life sciences, digital, manufacturing. You know, we don't live in a perfect world. Could it be better? Of course it could. Um, but I can tell you it's an awful lot better than it was. It's reasonably well balanced. And, um, and I think we're in reasonable shape at the moment in that respect. I, 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 you know, I'd welcome you sitting in on any of the board meetings if you'd so wish. There will be a public, public meeting later in the year. Um, you know, we, we, we don't hold these meetings in, in, in a closed environment for, for any reason other than the, the, the sensitive nature of some of the things that are discussed. 
There are a lot of papers that are put together representing and related to investments around individual businesses and, 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 and institutions. And, and it's not appropriate to share all of that in, in the public domain. Um, we do recognize certainly within the business board that um, we, we do not and have not done as good a job as we could of communicating all the good work that's been done. We've got some great things going on. Um, we've had our hands full over the last eight to 10 weeks with dealing with the COVID issues. And again, that has instilled and inspired some terrific work, innovation, thinking, new ideas, and people have been so busy with the sleeves rolled up, just getting on with it, um, that they don't have the time to, to take a step back and shout from the rooftops about it. There is a communications plan in place and two of the new board members have a communications background. One was the former editor of The Telegraph in Peterborough. We have set up a working group using those two people, working in conjunction with the, uh, the comms team within the combined authority to address the very point that's been raised. And I would hope that as weeks and months go by, you'll see more and more of that. Um, I would really welcome that. And I, I, I pay tribute to Austin's leadership. Um, it's just we're here to uh, ask questions. Um, the only question that maybe Rochelle can answer, Mayor, is the question about coterminosity um, and what, what, what the future direction is on that. Rochelle, we're struggling. We're struggling to hear you. Could you a bit sit a bit closer to the computer, please. Can you hear me better now? It's a bit better. Sorry. Okay. So, um, just backtracking slightly on the uh, reserve list point as well, just to address that. So, the the principle is that those people will undergo the full transparent process of recruitment, and it's really to safeguard of a situation, safeguard against a situation where we would have the quality issue if there was last minute resignation of, of any board member. So okay. to clarify the thinking behind the reserve list principle. In terms of, in terms of coterminous, we are continuing to work on this, so it's ongoing work. Um, but as and when we finalise the position, we will again come back to board with the principle. Um, and then just to, to finalise in terms of our uh, commitment in terms of uh, the diversity of the board, we are extending that commitment. So we received it this year, 2020, but actually we want to continue to, to achieve that target and with the expectation for the equal representation in 2023 and beyond. Okay, does that answer your question, Councillor Herbert? And while it puts it off, um, I was under the impression that Bayes were asking for action on coterminosity, not maybe do it next year. Um, um, it's not that I don't care about the wider geography, because obviously West Suffolk, a number of areas around Peterborough, we have really strong linkages with. But uh, I just think it completely fuzzies um, what the focus is. And I think there is great strength in the fact that along with the boundaries of local authorities, the combined authority has got a determination to focus, first of all, on our geography, but then second of all, on partnerships. And I, I think we have to sort out this issue of, of what area the business board is working on, albeit that- you know, I see, I, the, re, the reality is I don't, I don't think there's any, any uh, concern at all that the business board is working very much in coterminous with the combined authority area, however, uh, we have also taken over from the LEP and the LEP had commitments that were already outstanding outside the command authority area. And obviously we have a responsibility to those commitments as well. So the co-terminosity is exactly what we are working to now, but there are some historical decisions uh, that have to be adhered to as part of the, part of the work that's ongoing. Um, uh, Councillor Count. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, thank, thank you, Mayor. Two, two things I wish to add in. First, one of clarity and one of one of support. Uh, the first one of clarity, we had a discussion earlier on uh, Councillor Smith and, and Rochelle uh, about the activities of uh, political parties, and it was absolutely clarified uh, in terms of the Constitution 9.4, 9.38. However, a member of the public may not have been able to follow that if they were 
if they were uh, not in control of the papers. And all they would have heard were that, that, that we were allowing political activists into the private sector board. And then there were some clarifications afterwards about what may or may not have been there. So let me, so let me clear up in case there's a member of the public leaving it left in any doubt whatsoever. The new revised constitution contains the same clause as the old one that no member of parliament, officer of a recognised political party or anyone making substantial political contributions, personal contributions, uh, will be allowed to be a private sector board member. So I just didn't want to leave any aftertaste of impropriety there um, because it's not easy sometimes to get through messages when you're dealing with technical de detail. Uh, the second point I wanted to raise was one of support for Austin Adams' position on the board with regards to political involvement. I was a long-serving member of the previous LEP, uh, must, much to my chagrin. Uh, it was not an easy place to be. It failed, uh, as far as I was concerned, as an organisation. It was governance deficit. It had a deficit in governance. And I worked hard with the mayor and the government and eventually uh, moved this into the new model, uh, which is the business board in the combined authority. And the word LEP, so we, we're calling this a business board, but the word LEP originally started, it was a local and ent enterprise partnership, local rep representing local government, enterprise being the business element, and a partnership meaning that we work together. And other LEPs have them all on the same board. So they have the local government, which uh, Councillor Smith was referring to, on the same board as the enterprise, the business. And that was a failure in, in Cambridgeshire. And it's running much better now. We heard of the successes earlier. I, I really take my hat off to Austin and his entire team in what you're delivering as the business board. But the local government partnership element comes in at a board level where we're asked to uh, look at your decisions and see if they match up to our strategic objectives. And it's as simple as that. And I'm very comfortable with where we are at the moment. We've, we've let you know what our strategic objectives are. We get to decide when they come in front of us in the board. It's not a rubber stamping exercise. We are ent entirely of our own mind, whether we, we back these decisions or not, as we are entitled to. There was an informal discussion re recently because we've approved everything put in front of us because it's so well worked up, whether it's even a necessary step. Um, but I must say that I, I said it is a necessary step because without that, we lose that partnership element where the local government gets sight of the activities and decides whether that's in line with our strategic objectives. So this system is working. This system is working really, really well. The old system didn't work. And in terms of governance, the government have been all over this, both in its formation and since its formation, to decide if they're happy with it. And we've passed all of those uh, elements with flying colours, colours with our assurance framework and the design and setup. Now, government may wish to change things at a future point in time. They may well wish to adopt a model such as ours. But I know one thing for certain, they wouldn't like the recreation of the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough LEP that, uh, that we had beforehand. So firmly behind Austin on this. And, and no, I, I like the business board and the decisions coming up to the combined authority. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Count. Uh, Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much, um, Councillor Count. Um, I made a mistake and I'm sorry about that and I didn't mean to cause offence. So thank you for making that clear to anybody who's, uh, who's listening in. Um, but I just want to sort of come back on this, this business about um, democratic rep representation. Um, you know, that there is a risk that the, even though we are signing the, the business, sorry, the combined authority board is signing off decisions to the business board, there is a risk that this becomes a sort of rubber stamping exercise. And I do think we as leaders actually can be of value to the business board. You know, we, we, we know our local economies very, very, very well. Uh, we know the hot spots. We know we know our businesses very well. So I think there's possibly um, an, a discussion to be had later about how we can develop relationships between those of us leading different councils and the business board, because you feel very, very remote to me at the moment. Uh, you know, the, the papers come to the board. We, you know, we. Uh, 
I support what Councillor Count has said, you know, we're very pleased with the work that's being done. We're very pleased with the officers who are working with the bis business board and the amount of effort that's gone, gone in. But you still, feel, you still feel remote. So I think, there is, you know, if we're, not, if we're not to be invited onto your board, then what are you going to do, Mr Adams, to, you know, improve your, your communications with us as leaders and as as people who know our own economy so that we've got a flow of uh, dialogue between us so that you know we can feel part of the business board to, to a greater greater respect which i think will be useful to all of us i think councillor smith has been mentioned many times um uh, you get all of the papers that come before you at the command authority board that's where the political input comes in. I absolutely agree with Mr Adams in his assertion that as long as he's chairman and certainly as long as I'm mayor we will try and keep politics out of the decision making for the business board. Uh, this, is, this is where the politics happens and believe you me it's very refreshing in the business board where there is no politics uh, and decisions are made entirely on their own, on their own, uh, on their own merit. So um, I think we've discussed this significantly. There is political input. This is it. This is where you get your chance to vote. Uh, and uh, Austin, do you have a seconder for the proposals you have put before us? Uh, Councillor Bailey has put her hand up. Um, uh, so I will, uh, as has been considerable discussion, I will go through and ask in turn. Uh, those in favour, Councillor Bailey? Agreed. Uh, Councillor Bowden? Agreed. Uh, Councillor Fuller? Agreed. Uh, Councillor Herbert? Agreed. Uh, Councillor Holditch. Is John still with us? Um, I missed out. Apologies, Councillor Count. It wasn't personal. Councillor Count. Agreed. Uh, and Councillor Smith. I'll agree. Okay, so that's everybody in agreement apart from Councillor Holditch, who unfortunately is not available. Um, thank you very much. So we move on to... Uh, the urgent report um, uh, on uh, emergency acts of uh, active travel, advanced payments to highways authorities. This key decision is being taken under the special urgency arrangement set out in the constitution and with the agreement of Councillor Dupre, the chair of Overview and Scrutiny Committee. As chair of the board, I've agreed to take as an urgent item at today's meeting as required by section 100B, brackets four, brackets B of the Local Government Act 1972. Paul Range, Director of Delivery and Strategy, would you please introduce the report? Certainly, Mayor, thank you. And, and I should say thank you to the, the board for taking this as an urgent item and we're grateful to the Chair of Overview and Scrutiny for authorising that as well. Um, you'll see as the, this goes on, it's quite fast moving stuff and we want to make sure um, decisions get taken in a way that allows things to proceed as fast as they can. So um, we're asking you to to note what's happening on active travel at the moment, um, to authorise payments to the two highways authorities and to authorise uh, advance payments uh, funded through the combined authorities reserves of payments that we won't get from the government um, for a little while yet in order to help keep things moving fast. Um, so in terms of what's going on, um, and this partly goes back to the overview scrutiny question uh, that, was, that was raised earlier, um, as you said, Mayor, you had an exchange with the Prime Minister right back at the beginning of uh, May, wrote to the Prime Minister. Soon after that, there was a, an announcement of national funding for active travel measures. Um, active travel has always been one of your priorities as a board. It's reflected in the local transport plan and so on. Um, but at the moment, with the transport restart after the COVID lockdown, with public transport running at, um, effectively, you can only get 18 people onto a 100-person double-decker bus with public transport not able to run at its full capacity um, and people going back to work. There is a risk that everybody will pile into the private car um, and so we want to really encourage active travel in the short term, uh, both because of air quality and carbon issues but also actually just because of short-term congestion. Um, at the Mayor's request, the uh, Highways Authorities developed uh, uh, a really thorough long list of measures ranging from very short-term pop-up reallocations of road space through to bigger infrastructure measures. Um, in the absence of the actual allocation of government funding, the highways authorities have been absolutely brilliant um, uh, in 
just diving ahead and starting to put measures in place um, effectively at financial risk to themselves. So in the week commencing the 24th of May, um, five schemes were put in place in the city of Cambridge, for example. Um, we've now had at the end of last week an allocation of government money, which for the whole area uh, is 2.9 uh, million pounds. That's being paid to us in two tranches. The first tranche, 25%, 575,000 uh, pounds coming now. The second tranche, another 2.3 million pounds coming, quote, later in the summer. And we don't know when later in the summer is. Um, we are proposing to allocate that funding between the two authorities using uh, the same formula the government has used to allocate uh, between areas, which would give within the overall 2.9 million, it gives 2.1 uh, to Cambridgeshire County Council's area and 0.8 million to Peterborough's area. Um, and we are asking you please to authorize us to pay that all now. Um, which is a kind of cash flow, uh, piece of cash flow support in effect coming from the combined authorities reserves um, and we will be claiming the second tranche in due course. Um, in terms of immediate next steps, we need to put together an action plan for the first tranche funded activity uh, this week. Um, as at 9.30 this morning, um, every district had contributed to putting that together and we're very confident that, that can be finalized by the end of this week and we hope that we'll be able to communicate it uh, publicly uh, at the end of this week as well and we have learning a little bit from what happened last week um, I've put in place an arrangement which makes sure that the police and the uh, uh, bus companies will be consulted on things before we uh, uh, decide on them so that's where we are um, and we'd be very grateful for your authorization to make those payments to the highways authorities so that we can crack on uh, thank you, Mr. Raines. Uh, members of Councillor Herbert. Sorry, was that me? I didn't catch half of what you said. Yeah, I've definitely got you, Councillor Herbert. Thank you. Um, no, I'd just like to pay tribute to the efforts that have been put in because. Um, this is the kind of example where by working together we can get right all to listen and I know the amount of work that's gone in at the County Council and I'm presuming very similar at, at Peterborough. Um, yeah, we have to be innovative. Um, we have cleaner air both in the market towns and in Cambridge than we've had for a couple of decades and we've got um, the opportunity to install some measures A to help keep our towns and cities safe, but also uh, enable people to move around in different ways. It would be a real tragedy if we allowed things just to jump back to uh, uh, congested uh, roads at peak times. I think some of the working pattern changes would really help. And I think we just need to work with um, each of the business sectors, including retail, education, um, and other employers. If we could just organize different work, slightly different working and timing patterns of schools, of uh, workplaces, as well as this uh, welcome move where a lot of people will be working from home. And if we work in partnership between district councils and the county and include others, the combined authority clearly also the GCP is doing quite a lot of delivery um, in Cambridge. I think we can just end up with a far better response on transport and at the same time be delivering and supporting the work that you are leading on the Climate Change Commission. We really do have an opportunity and I do hope that quite a lot of the measures will prove their worth and that they'll be still here in 10 or 20 years time. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Well, I totally agree, Councillor Herbert. Uh, one of the key is, keys is going to get businesses to stagger their open times. And uh, as you're aware, I've sent a letter to businesses across the entire county requesting that. I think it's probably important I follow that up over the next week or two uh, to reiterate that point. Because what I'm hearing is, despite a lot of effort going into uh, uh, making sure, for example, shops in, uh, open later uh, and shut later, um, a lots of uh, multinationals are not listening to that advice and uh, and there's a real concern that I have that our city centres and town centres will will not uh, adhere to the advice of staggering open times and that's, con that's concerning. Um, Councillor Bailey, your hand is up 
but I think that's from before, unless it's up for now, is it? Good. Yes, okay. it, was, it was up before Councillor Herbert, but not a problem. Not no, I thought it was from when you seconded the motion earlier. My apologies. No problem at all. It was interesting to hear from Councillor Herbert in advance anyway. Um, I mean, East Cams has just closed uh, just three or four days ago. Uh, it's very extensive district-wide bus cycle walk consultation where we've uh, surveyed every single, or sent a survey to every single household across the district. It's been a very extensive far-reaching detailed exercise so we're um, eagerly anticipating the results um, of that which we will obviously feed into the bus the, the CA's bus review work uh, but also puts us in a, a good position to understand um, you know short-term and long-term opportunities around improvements on cycling and walking infrastructure so we'll obviously be feeding those in. We have fed in some uh, very quick immediate short-term for the first tranche of this money uh, from East Cams um, you know, and we focused on opportunities. I think we've not, we will never had such opportunities to trial schemes as we have now in the current climate. I think, um, you know, it gives us a real opportunity to do that. Uh, but also just to sort out some of those real niggle points for cyclists, you know, it, where a drop curb is needed or the cobbles are loose or whatever it might be. So, so we've done that. My, my real question though, is that I kind of feel like, um, you know, the, imme the immediate things that were coming forward were obviously based in Cambridge City uh, and Peterborough. Um, you know, and I understand lots of reasons around that and that, that's absolutely fine. Uh, but, you know, Cam Cambridge City does have the GCP. It's had millions upon millions of pounds for very many years now to implement schemes that make active travel uh, more attractive than and you know, public transport attractive. Uh, whereas, you know, the other districts and the outlying areas haven't had the benefit of, of that and have had very little money to make improvements, uh, very, very short of money to make improvements over a very long time. So a lot of our improvements are stacked up issues that really should have been dealt with given a, a more fair funding climate for Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. Um, so my real question is, you know, now that we've submitted, had to turn them around very quickly and we will be uh, doing much more detailed work, now that we've submitted those, you know, it kind of feels like everything's going into a bit of a black hole behind the scenes and someone is going to come out the other side and someone's going to make decisions on what's getting in and what isn't. So obviously I want to understand how we're going to ensure fairness across the districts, noting that South Cambridgeshire and Cambridge City do have the benefit of the GCP. And what we can't be doing is soaking up this money on schemes that really should and could and may be dealt with by, via the GCP. Uh, and that has to be coordinated and well managed. Um, and, you know, this cannot just be about um, Cambridge City and, and Peterborough City. So I want to understand uh, how, you know, both immediately and the longer term as the money, you know, you're, we're forward funding the money now. So it feels like a bit of a bum fight, putting it bluntly, and I don't want it to feel like that. And I, I've not seen anything written down about how we're fairly allocating this money and making sure it's spread out evenly and fairly to the best benefit of all of us. Yeah, um, thank you, Councillor Bailey. I mean, I think that's a very valid point. When, when uh, initially I spoke to Councillors Holditch and Count uh, and, uh, and their, their, their transport representatives, this is an opportunity to bid into that money, to bid into government to see if we could get some extra money. As we are all aware, the GCP have recently had funding of £400 million, which dwarfs £2.9 million. Uh, perhaps, Councillor Count, you could answer me uh, uh, and let me know what investment the GCP are putting into the cycle routes, if any. So I think it'd be uh, useful for me if I come back to the board with the, how we're going to allocate the money, uh, bearing in mind the you know that there are separate there's been a lot of money spent by the GPC in Cambridge City and South Cams. Um, that doesn't mean they're not eligible for any more, but I do think that we need to respond with what is going to be a, a, a fair way. That doesn't mean you divide the money equally or by population. I don't know what it means yet. What I do know is I've actively asked the district areas for proposals to come forward uh, as much as I have Cambridge City because I'm keen that active travel applies to everybody across the whole piece and not just to certain select areas. Um, so I'll, I'll come back with a formal reply to the board. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hurley, you've put your hand up. 
Yeah, I mean, I th the, a number of these measures are trials that are in response to um, coronavirus. And the, uh, so uh, to respond to Councillor Bailey, I mean, I take the point that it, and uh, you haven't seen me at these meetings uh, saying no to focusing on, um, uh, on Peterborough, on uh, Wisbeach, uh, Fenland, Huntingdonshire, and East Cambridgeshire, but but there are there are there are op and and we we're all in this together. Um, albeit that um, the epidemic hurt some parts of the world a lot more than others. So, in in response, there are a number of these schemes which would never have been on the GCP's list because they're things that we could not even trial. Um, when you're in a congested city, or same with the market towns, and I'm sure, um, uh, Anna, that you know schemes in Ely that just wouldn't have been possible to test. There are good reasons why a lot of the schemes, particularly the ones in Cambridge, uh, removing parking bays here and there, or giving priority, or uh, changing the way the city centre works, we just literally were not able to come forward with anything that would have stuck. Um, so I'm very happy to be part of the dialogue, but I do think that um, the nature of these schemes is they are once in a lifetime opportunity of taking advantage in, in, in a very sad circumstance um, of being able to do things we weren't able to do before. So um, happy to be part of discussions, but some of the schemes would, were just simply not going to be possible uh, until now. Um, I would like a different world, a cleaner air world in our towns, in the market towns and in Cambridge. Um, and I think this is just uh, something that's come along as a byproduct of where we're at, um, of that economic slowdown. And it would be great if we could all benefit from this, this funding. Um, and, and that it is shared across and that we see some schemes in every single market town and, and stretching out into rural areas as well. Okay, thank you, Councillor Herbert. Councillor Bailey? If I could just respond, and I really welcome that, and absolutely, Councillor Herbert, you often talk about, about Wisbeach and Fenland and, and East Cams, and I thank you for it. Um, so thank, thank you for that. And, and my question really that I'm sort of leaving on the table is what is the GCP doing to, you know, deliver some of these uh, innovative schemes that couldn't have been contemplated before but can now and you've got prime opportunity and it would be interesting to hear what they're doing to relieve the burden on the overall funding pot that is available to make more money available right across the whole piece because I think the GCP has significant, fu uh, significant funds and a significant opportunity to uh, add to the overall, overall benefit for everybody. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Bailey. Councillor Herbert. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And, and, and it's a, they're, they're fair questions. I think one of the biggest things the GCP is doing is that we do have staffing and resource capacity. And insofar as we can take a burden off the County Council, we will deal with the schemes that are in Greater Cambridge and, and manage those. And, and I think one of the real pressures on, uh, and I, I presume Steve, uh, Steve Count will probably agree, is that there's plenty else being having to be dealt with currently, um, and the GCP will divert officer resource and thereby take some of definitely the officer pressure and that overhead off the county council um, in our geography, which will enable faster action, I believe, um, for schemes in Ely, in Huntingdon, in March, and in Peterborough. Uh, Councillor Kent. Uh, thank, thank you, Mayor, and thank, thank you, Lewis, for that uh, offer of um, some capacity in the officer card, right? Because um, whilst we've been talking all day, we, we, you know, coronavirus has been mentioned. I don't think I could understate the actual impact on our ability to run our ordinary day-to-day -day business. For example, I've got about a thousand people that have uh, uh, had to place themselves at their home location uh, because of coronavirus. So whether they're shielded themselves or a member of their family is shielded, or various other needs, you know, now a lot of them can work from home either at their own job or they've been deployed into other jobs. So we're not in the normal circumstances at the moment. So the offer of support is uh, very grateful and uh, I shall be feeding that onto my office officers. Um, on the subject of a once in a lifetime chance, I think the, the, um, the, the roads are less occupied at the moment and that is certainly uh, true of a life, once in a lifetime chance. However, the once in a lifetime chance for funding is not quite so true um, because even apart from the GCP, we've seen in the past 
a lot of times I've been asked why Cambridge City is having all its money spent on cycling. And um, the simple fact of the matter is the funding made available from government was very specific to urban areas because so they saw the greatest impact of their bang for their buck. So whilst the county council would have loved to have put in applications for, say, my hometown of March or Anna's of, of Ely, they were ruled out and exempted from some of the competitions to get funding. So there were, on top of the GCP, there's been other funding streams into cycling in Cambridge City, none of which I resent for Cambridge City. I'm really glad that we won those funding and, I, and I'm glad that we we're able to implement all those schemes, which has led them to being the number one walking and cycling city in the UK, almost double of that of their nearest rival, which is uh, Oxford. So I'm very pre proud of what we've been able to achieve and do there and it would be nice if we if now that there is some funding available to actually replicate that in some of the other areas that that demand uh, cycle cycle ways as well um, but i want to go on to a question for the the combined authority really and it's a thought piece we're seeing the world changing in very many different ways and and this coronavirus may or may not be with us for a long period of time but i certainly believe that the um behavior of people will be behave will be changed quite permanently, no matter if coronavirus was cured tomorrow. For example, I expect businesses and people to want to work at home a lot more than they do at the moment. That, that I think will become fixed into our society in another way. But we're also seeing other changes, technological changes, primarily what I'm thinking about here is e-bikes. So e-bikes make the ability to cycle much, much easier for a wider proportion of the population over longer distances. So I'm quite comfortable cycling over a reasonable uh, travel to work area, but some people will be really assisted by e-bikes. And it, if we anticipate that this can make a significant difference, then I believe that the current um, requirements we have for cycling lanes, when we're able to put in a full width one, according to Sustrans, is really not sufficient for the future. And I wonder if the combined authority would like to um, have a look at that element think about what they want from a cycle lane in the future and start building for the future and perhaps set us some standards in advance of the national standards. And I think there's a very good reason for that. I love Cambridgeshire and Peterborough being ahead of the rest of the country in green things. I love them being ahead of the rest of the country in, in technological things. But I also firmly believe that this is a direction that, that we will all take. We will widen our cycle lanes and it'd be better if we got decided what was best for Cambridgeshire ahead of nat national guidance. Um, it will cost money, there's no doubt about that. If we decide that there's a new standard that is bigger than the one we have at the moment, it will cost more money. But so that's why I'm posing the question, but I think it's well worth considering doing some work on and perhaps giving, setting down some standards for us to consider as part of the local transport plan as, a, as um, you know, what is an acceptable cycleway of the future. Uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor Cowan. Councillor Bailey? Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry to labour the point, but I'm going to do it anyway at the risk of boring everybody senseless. Um, and again, I welcome Councillor Herbert's uh, kind offer of uh, resources and staffing, which will certainly uh, go a long way to allowing uh, county council officers to concentrate on the other areas. However, I think it would be uh, very surprising, um, I think residents would be very surprised if the GCP weren't looking at the opportunities arising from COVID-19, and I'm sure you must be, um, and putting significant sums forward as to schemes that you can get up and running quickly and pop up schemes that you can trial. And I would absolutely expect that the GCP would be doing that in terms of furthering its aims towards what it's trying to do, which is a very specific thing around improving alternatives to the car uh, in Greater Cambridgeshire. So, uh, you know, Offer, offer, of, offer of resource and staff time and expertise, very, very welcome indeed. But, you know, the more the GCP steps up to the plate for Greater Cambridgeshire, you know, the more that is made available under the rest of the funding to, to the rest of the, you know, Peterborough, um, Huntingdonshire, Fenland and East Cams. Uh, and those three district areas, frankly, uh, have been left behind for a very, very long time. And the GCP has significant funding to do exactly what we're talking about. And I would expect it to step up now uh, and therefore release this other funding to, to the other areas. And that's really what I'm asking for. And I would just, uh, I've know I've, I've had a lot of time on it, but I, I would like to hear back from the GCP formally on what it is proposing to do and how it can therefore help uh, the rest of the county. 
I think Councillor Bailey's got an extremely strong, well put uh, point there. Um, and I think it would be uh, would be only right for the Command Authority Board to ask the GCP what their immediate response was, is to the COVID-19 crisis, what investment they're putting into cycle routes in the Cambridge area. Uh, we know that they've had uh, a massive boost of funding in the short term. Uh, are they repurposing? We've just had a Combined Authority Board meeting where we've repurposed millions of pounds to invest directly into our county. Uh, what is the GCP doing? I think those questions are, are apposite and I'm quite happy to write to the GCP and ask them on behalf of the board. Um, I think, you know, Councillor Bailey, Bailey has got a very good point. We bid in uh, to the Prime Minister, we wrote directly as a combined authority to the Prime Minister with the help of the transport authorities uh, in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough uh, for a £15 million package of, um, of, uh, of, of, for cycle routes across the whole county. Uh, and we have one part of the county which has £400 million in cash uh, and perhaps we should be encouraging that part of the county uh, to put its hand in its own pocket rather than take money from the market towns and from Peterborough. That's, yeah. a, that's a question I think is valid, valid to put. Uh, we, we, not, uh, James, uh, much as we would like um, to have £400 million in cash, um, what we have uh, isn't even half of that so far, um, as you're aware, um, and the combined authority will be shortly subject to an interesting gateway review in which it will be accountable for what it has delivered. Um, we have a commitment, we believe, for £40 million a year for the next five years. And yes, we have had more funding. Um, and I'm very happy to, if Councillor Bailey wants to be part of a discussion on this uh, uh, as well, to have a discussion with you um, and with our respective officers um, about this. We are committed, James, as you know, to working in partnership. Um, we have already done a lot of schemes, including um, schemes that we hope um, our rural greenways stretch out into East Cambridgeshire as well as um, uh, over into Huntingdonshire. So we do want to uh, work jointly with you, including on these measures. But I do underline that um, until this emergency came along, a whole range of these schemes were not suddenly possible. Um, and uh, we uh, are happy to be part of that discussion. But it isn't correct that the GCP has got £400 million sitting in the bank. We have um, the commitment uh, for up to £200 million, and we will be subject to a further gateway review. And um, as you know, uh, Mayor, um, when you look at the commitments that the Greater Cambridge Partnership are making, um, over 80% of that funding, nearly 90% of that funding, is specifically for routes that will enable CAM, um, a route out to the north, to Waterbeach, out to the east, towards East Cambridgeshire, and uh, areas that clearly Councillor Bailey has got interest in in Bottisham, the routes out um, past uh, uh, Addenbrooke to Linton, plus a route which is more contentious um, to Camborne and therefore beyond. So uh, it isn't as if the GCP has a lot of free money, but we are always open for discussion and we've, we'd welcome um, a request for a meeting on this specific subject. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Herbert. Um, so I have uh, nobody else uh, has requested to speak. So. Um, I will be uh, proposing from the chair. Do I have a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor Herbert. Uh, so all those in favour, uh, I assume, as nobody's voted against, spoken against, everybody's in favour. So uh, uh, we will say thank you and we will forward the money directly on to those transport authorities uh, to deliver. And uh, thank you very much indeed. And also thank you to central government for the investment into our area. Uh, part six is the uh, date of the next meeting. The board is provisionally scheduled to meet on Wednesday the 24th at 10.30am, 10, but this remains subject to confirmation so that observers are aware once I declare the meeting closed, the webcast will end and I therefore, therefore now declare this meeting closed. Thank you, everybody.